Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the newsroom. Um, for, for a couple of weeks, we are interviewing all the mayoral candidates this way. Um, this afternoon, we have Samuel Glover, uh, mayoral candidate. Thanks for joining us, Mr. Glover. Hey, thank you for having me. Um, we were uh, reminiscing um, um, about something that happened before many of you were born, perhaps, <laughs> uh, back in the 80s, um, when I lived over on Cedar Street and Sam was playing baseball and football in the, in the field next door to, to our house that we rented from Helen Myeski. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. Um, I remember that house because I had to I had to buy a stove <laughs> for it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it was a wonderful time to be alive, you know, in the eighties in Palm Bluff. Yeah. It, it was really a, a great time to be alive and it I, really was. You know, at that time I was about we moved over there in nineteen eighty five from um, actually from right by the university. Uh, my dad the reason we even got to Palm Bluff, my dad's first job, he was getting his uh, doctoral degree in oh, really? soil sciences at UMass by oh, wow. way of Alabama A&M, okay, university. And so- For Like distance learning? No, oh, he, you were there. he got were there. his master's degree and with my, my mom and him, both went to the University of uh, Alabama A&M University, okay? And he both had his master's degree, et cetera, and then he got his, I went to a doctoral program at the University of Massachusetts. So they lived up there for a while, and his first job was at University of Arkansas Pine Bluff okay. in the fall of 78, okay? So, so you lived close to campus at first. I did, but the, the funny thing is, you know, my mom said this, uh, she's like, well, you really weren't supposed to be born. We were done having kids. <laughs> it was four kids, it was four children, and uh, I've got I- have got a little brother, little brother like that. So. Yeah, so, you know, uh, we came in, the family came in 78, but I was born right at Jefferson Regional. Uh, Dr. Rolfe yeah. uh, delivered me in 1980, January 1980. What's your birthday? January 22nd, 1980. So I just Happy turned birthday. 44 years old. Thank Happy you. Birthday. Yeah. I'm a little older. My birthday was on the 9th. <laughs> so, you know, we, we moved over to, you know, five years there. So it was uh, just amazing times being on the campus uh, at UAPB because I actually went to uh, daycare and pre-K at that campus and fond memories of being able to put the UAPB helmet on and walk around the campuses. It was very engaging at, at that time. Uh, we would come in and firefighters and, and um, policemen would come to the daycares and let us put on hats and different oh, things cool. like that it, it was really it was really uh awesome time so you know fast forwarding we moved to uh, 17th and cedar down the street from central park where of course the takes were so cool you know and uh, letting us play in that field because you know during that time you know it was probably 60 children in that neighborhood and we played all the time we had our basketball goals you know several goals in the in the community and we would play every sport and we would just play all day and you know, people talk about this new generation, you know, of children. Well, the, the, diff, the only difference that I see is that they're not playing. Was outside. that the last generation of kids that just left? They couldn't imagine sitting in the house, let's go out and play something? Well, you know, we were also put out of the house. You know, they, well, hey, okay, true. go outside, don't go watch the TV, go. Yeah, go do something active and quit coming in and out of my house. I'm not even sure there was much on TV. Was that, <laughs> were you still in the like 4, 7, 11 and maybe educational TV? There just wasn't much to Well, occupy. I have to say we were blessed. My, my father, he was really, really big on entertainment for us and family entertainment. And I grew up with that strong nucleus. And so we, we had HBO and we had um, some of those uh, USA Network, some of them in the early, you know, you know, 84, 85, yeah. we would watch family movies like The Color Purple and Rocky and Superman, all the whole family there sitting together, shelling peas and, and, and <laughs> I'm serious, Mama, Mama peeling, because uh, my, my mom, she would can vegetables yeah. and fruit and things like that. And so it was, 
with a family of seven, you know, my dad's main focus was providing, making sure we had plenty of food and clothes and all that wasn't really, and, and that we had a good time together. That was our big thing in our home. And so, was Miss Simpson still living? Miss Simpson, listen, Miss Simpson was in that house uh, right next uh, catacorn to us. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. Because that's when we bought the house next to her. That's right. After a few years. You had Miss Simpson, Mr. Nelson, Dr. Satcher, uh, Mr. Fontenet, the Brazels over at uh, the, the Lifetime members over at Lakeside Methodist. Uh, you had uh, uh, the Jackson family, the Washington family. The Browns, I mean, so many families, uh, really nuclear families, and um, lots of children. Now, those were there. cool houses, too. They were, and I mean, built the, to last. The, um, the one we moved into in, at uh, 17, 1720 Cedar was, had nine foot ceilings and built in bookshelves and a fireplace. Yeah. And, um, it was solid. It, it was. And, um, had a garage. Uh, Ariston Jacks and the Elliot's over on Hickory Street. It, it was a lot of people. Uh, Tory Hunter was actually living on Hickory Street around that really? same time. Like Basil Shabazz lived right around the corner. Oh, wow. So all of those names that you see popping up now and they're legendary, they were really all in that neighborhood. Marvin Hintz. Well, that was Central Pond Bluff. It was. And it was a very uh, wonderful place and a wonderful time to be alive. You know, but, people, <clears throat> I had a guy call me. It's been a couple of years. He called me up, and it was back before uh, Mr. Husband and Waco mm -hmm. took over the Pine Bluff commercial, but he uh, called up, and, you know, there, the paper wasn't as big as it used to be and not as many pages and so forth. And he said, I wish we had the paper that we had back in, back in the 80s, back in 86. He actually pinned it. Right. And I was like... It's like, you're out of luck, buddy, because I was here in 86. I was working for the paper in 86. I said, what'd your town look like <laughs> in 86? You know, right. how many how many places on Main Street could you go and buy a men's suit? How many grocery stores could you go to around town? Take right. your pick. Right. Uh, I said, you know, a newspaper is, is a reflection of the community. It represents, I mean, in those days, you know, right. newspapers have other issues now. But, um, yeah, the town, it's, it was still humming pretty good it was. in the mid-80s. And again, I just, the, the things that there were to do and the interest of the families and the children with what those things, something like, we used to, my mom used to take me to the Little Red Firehouse to oh, read yeah. books and to do crafts and things. You know, was that had, an art center? It was. It was yeah. like a miniature art center right over there in front of Lakeside. Right, right. You know, yeah. but now, you, you know, when you hear families uh, or people say there's nothing to do in Pine Bluff and then someone may respond most of the time the people you hear respond and say well we have a brand new library they're responding because they're coming from that angle of well we had so many things to do we need to engage the children more with these activities because if all we do is inundate them with uh, the latest trend they'll miss out on some of those foundational things that really I feel like made our generations stronger, uh, both mentally and physically, yeah, to be honest. And we, you know, we had Atari and Nintendo, and we played those a lot. But yeah. we had to go outside and play sports, run around, and do every all of those things. And we had to be engaged. Uh, I'm picturing in my mind's eye that field with so many kids in it. We used to call it OD one, old dusty one. <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah, because behind there, right beside Ariston Jackson's house, yeah. who did the logo for UAPB. Oh, really? Uh, the new logo yeah. with the lion mane. He drew that, but uh, and he was always a great artist. But beside his house was a rock field. So we would play baseball. If we played football in, in the field beside your house, then we would put that down, get tired of that, pick up the baseballs, and go play baseball in the rock lot beside that, right beside Emmanuel Baptist Church. You know, at that time, um, Huckabee was the preacher yeah, over there, the yeah. pastor over there. So a lot of rich of history. We had a city park down the street. Too. City park down the street, Bloom Tennis Center. Yeah. Again, back to that engagement, my mom made us go do summer tennis lessons. 
right. the free uh, tennis lessons. And so when I was Parks and Recreation Director, those are some of the things that I tried to reconnect with the youth programming in the city because I saw how vital it was. And we actually had great success there. And a guy named Chris Simmons would come in and teach the kid. He still does that. Uh, but all of the time I was there, we would bring Mr. Simmons in and have these spring and summer uh, tennis camps for the children. And it started to pick up and, and engage more and more because you have to expose uh, our youth to more than just two to three things. We need a, a plethora of activity and opportunity for them to be successful. You mentioned the library, and I think um, Ricky the uh, director there, you know, he confronts that. It's like, it's a, it's a good library, but you gotta have more than a good library to get kids in because they're like, it's a, ha it's a, it's a big building with books. And, and Ricky has tried, and I think he has succeeded in a lot of ways to present more than just a big, pretty building with a lot of books. Well, with the changing of the time and the culture, it is that, but it's so much more. Yeah. You know, I think about Imagination Library and things that, there are a lot of engaging activities other than just going, you know, to, to the card catalog, if you will, yeah. and getting the book. It's things that they can do, but again, I think part of the issue, not just in our city, because culturally around the country and around the world, social media, of course, it, it can be a double-edged sword, and it's affecting how children and how people process and access information uh, it makes it kind of it creates a microwave situation if you will mm -hmm. I don't have to look in a dictionary I'm going to google it or now I just tell oh, yeah. Siri to tell me which can be beneficial but it kind now of we have AI which I'm not even sure you have to go to google anymore. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting but, but what it does is it takes away the critical skills yeah. and some of the soft skills that we talk about in uh, this generation some of them not all are lacking or are have areas of growth in it's because they're being weakened by culturally but the way that we I feel like we address that is that we give them the balanced diet if you just give, if you just eat Twinkies all day, of course you're going to probably end up obese and high blood pressure and diabetes. But you have to have vegetables, fruits, right. you know, et cetera. And now we know that uh, eating closer to a vegetarian or vegan type diet is more healthy uh, for us as as humans with the things that they're putting in the food. And you say that's important. I believe the balance having things that are, are fair and balanced in our lives in every aspect, I believe makes a well-rounded individual just in general. Well, obviously you and I could just sit here and chat, but <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you everybody for uh, following us down memory lane, but let's, uh, you have, you have uh, thrown your hat in the ring. Um, tell us, you have told us something about yourself, but tell us how you got, um, you, you, most people know you as the former uh, Parks and Rec director. So right. how'd you get there and what have you been doing since then? We'll, we'll talk uh, about your run for mayor. Okay, well, kind of a shorter version of what I could tell um, is that I was blessed enough to and fortunate to be one of the top track and field athletes in the country as a junior and then a senior in high school at Pine Bluff High School. I was recruited by the national champion Razorbacks to go and initially I didn't oh, really want to do that. That's the era when McDonald was, yeah, was John like McDonald, winning greatest everything coach, every year. Greatest coach ever uh, <clears throat> in history as far as national championships yeah. and things of that nature. He's a legend and uh, Coach McDonald recruited me heavily and I actually didn't want to go. I wanted to go to an HBCU uh, because that's all I knew in my life. Because um, your dad. Because of my dad and yeah. my mom and really my entire family. Uh, we had, actually have a legacy at Alabama A&M University, but I knew I didn't want to go there. Uh, and then my cousin, my favorite cousin, he went to Southern University. And we were like just a few days apart or a few months apart. 
and we grew up together. And he said, I'm going to Southern. I said, well, I'm going to Southern. <laughs> you know, um, and long story did short. Did you say they recruited you too? They did recruit me, but um, <clears throat> oddly, I had not taken my ACT yet. And this is going to be, uh, this is going to come up later of why that's valid. I hadn't taken it yet because I didn't know the process of becoming a student athlete because I was the first person in my family to receive even an offer for an athletic scholarship. It was all academics with us, so we didn't even know that process of recruiting, et cetera. Yeah. And so they dropped off of me because I would answer the phone with the Razorback coach and say, well, I don't want to go to Arkansas. I'm going to Southern. I would tell him, and he would call me, Steve Silby. He would call me <laughs> every week. I'm serious. Sometimes twice a week, and I would just tell him, no, 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 and he would keep calling. He was very persistent. But What was your – where did you – Excel. Were you a distance runner? Or? No, I was a sprinter, sprinter. and a hurdler and okay. a relay specialist. And uh, it was George Shelton, my high school coach. He uh, really a legendary coach in the state of Arkansas. And in Pine Bluff, he's coached at Dollarway, Washington Chapel, Augusta, uh, Little Rock Central. He's uh, recently retired. But it was him that said, if you want to break records and have a great college career, go to Southern. But if you want the big show, go to Arkansas. I didn't even know anything about him. And I said, well, I want the show. <laughs> you know, because, you know, I've been doing all you this that way. <laughs> across the country. I said, I want the show. I went to Fayetteville, and my life's changed. It's like my second home. I love it up there. And as we, we see, Northwest Arkansas was burgeoning and booming yeah. um, in so many things. I was fortunate to be there in the beginning of that boom. So I'll... As we talked about earlier, I saw the decline in our neighborhoods in Pine Bluff. Now I can, I have a perspective where I can look back and see and really pinpoint what happened in our community. And I can look and pinpoint in Fayetteville, in that community, when things started to really pick up and what actually happened to why they picked up. Don't you know some people who have left here and just moved up there and retired? I do know a lot yeah. of people because, you know, things were prog are progressive, but you have a, a generator a generator there in that you've got 27 26 to 28,000 students every year and then they they have the jobs to you know hire those uh, individuals after they get a degree etc and so we have a, a wonderful higher learning institution here as well at University of Arkansas Pine Bluff and what we have to do in the city is have some jobs for them so that they can stay and then have a quality of life so they would want to stay but again, I went to Ar Arkansas. I was a four-time All-American, two-time national champion. I didn't know that, Sam. I didn't know well, you know, I did all four those Four-time All-American? Four-time All-American. Uh, probably would have been more, but I had some adversity because I didn't want to go to class. All I cared about was sports. All I ever wanted to do, been you know there. how you put your goals out? My goal was simple. I had it all planned out. Olympics. Well, actually, national champion, Olympics, three times, retire, coach track and field yeah. on the college level for 10 years, retire, go back to school, get a doctor, like my dad, in history, though, I was, I'm a history major, and come back and teach high school history. You did have and a retire. Time and retire and at retire. 55 years old. That's what I wanted to do. And none of that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Except I got my, I did get my degree in history and I, I thoroughly enjoy it because what those things did was it, it helped Fayetteville. me in Fayetteville. Yeah. Um, uh, but I got my degree at the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. Back to that adversity, you know, I was actually dismissed from school twice. That's part of my story. I don't shy away from it. I did not want to go to class, because but that's what makes like, me, yeah. that's what I feel like makes me a strong mentor in my mentoring uh, program and throughout the years is because I can tell the real deal about, listen, if you don't do this, this is definitely going to happen. not keep you around. And that's the bottom line, but I have to come in Frank Broyles. <clears throat> he said, once a Razorback, always a Razorback. And they paid for my school even when my scholarship was up. And I thanked them for that. But it was dear mother 
that embraced me when I could not do any of that anymore and I couldn't afford to, I was working a full-time job at no. the English building, training for the 2004 Olympics and going to class and paying for school. Like, you know, my they paid my tuition, but I had to pay my room and board, et cetera. And finally I had to come home. And uh, I came home back to Palm Bluff in about 2006. And I spent three years volunteering my, my time at local high schools, at UAPB, uh, things like that. And I was the assistant coach, track coach in 2009 at UAPB, but I didn't have my degree yet. They would say, hey, get your degree, get your degree. And then I got the degree. I, re I received my bachelor in history from UAPB. UAPB. Okay? Yeah. So now I'm thinking, again, I didn't know how this process worked because I've just been immersed in athletics totally until I'm 27 you know, 25, 27 years old, which is not your average. Right. You know, it's different for athletes, student athletes, especially when you're performing at a certain level, you have a, a different track. That being said, I've thought that I could just get the degree and so I would immediately get hired and go to University of Florida and be the assistant sprint coach because I had all of these connections. No job, no leads, I knew all of these people. And I came back to Palm Bluff. Again, I'm here in Palm Bluff with a degree, experience, and the only job that would hire me, Frank Anthony. My mom asked Frank Anthony, would he give me a job? And you know what they had for me? A security officer at Jack Robert Junior High. Oh, wow. And he looked at my resume and said, you overqualified. How do you feel? being all of this and now you are a security guard. I said, I don't feel anything, sir. I need a job. And what that did though, it was a sobering moment in my life and a humbling moment. And it showed me two things. It showed me number one, that there's a, there, there's a, there's a disconnect in the community to where some of our, some of those that have gone before us are like, get your grades and have good character and do these great things in life. And then you do them and now it's time, I need a job. I need a door open. I need some help. Can't do nothing for you, so that's four and no more. And you know, that that's a, that's a prevalent trend in our community where people come back home and they need that assistance. We're not talking about government assistance. We need an opportunity. We need a door to open. And uh, from there, from Jack Roby with uh, Mr. Ronald Laurent and Eric Elders and Doris Leonard and the teachers that were there, the coaches, that was one of the best jobs that I've ever had because I took that job very seriously. And I knew that I was in charge of those kids' safety. And, and I learned a lot there in interacting with the people and being amongst the people and the children. Some of those same children are actually mentees of mine and they're doing wonderful. Some of the people that I met at Jack Roby, like Yamna Sargent, she's with the NRCS in Bakersfield, California, doing wonderful. You know, Brandon Bland, you know, I, I could go on and on about some of these stories, these success stories, but I met them there. And from there, Lighthouse Academy when they came with their charter school. Yeah. I believed in that because when Mr. Ronan came down, again from Massachusetts, and I kind of connected with that storyline, so to speak, but he was really talking about, and this is in the beginning stages of this charter movement. Right. He had a great plan. Lighthouse Academy did not have the capacity to do what they were talking about doing. The great ideas, no capacity. And when I came in, I was literally a paraprofessional. So I walked that road. And they saw my skill set and said, well, we need you to do this after school program and create these after school programs, what I was calling the STAR program and these groups, et cetera. And then they said, well, your sk the skill set, this, this guy's overqualified to be doing this. We need more out of him. So then they promoted me to the director of school culture. So now, as a director of school culture and sort of the dean of students, because I was over all the disciplinary, you know, having to do state reports, 
creating the athletic department. I was the director of transportation because this again this is a, a infantile school right in its infant stages and I had a lot of their programs had to be created. I wrote their handbook and you had nothing to go on right restorative justice all of these things I, I, we brought some of those concepts to Pine Bluff uh, because there was still corporal punishment when we were at Jack Roby just two years previous and so things of that nature and being able to interact and I'm going somewhere with this because it's shaped who I am, right? And so I was at Lighthouse Academy for about tell four me you're years. Writing a book or something. <laughs> well, eventually, but uh, then I left that job and started my own business, e-commerce and fitness, a uh, Go Elite training, and I went from one client to seventy in one year in 2017. I did that all the way up into July. What service did you provide? I provided, again, elite athletic training for athletes specifically to help them go to the next level. I've got kids that have gone to the SEC, to the NFL, to UAPB, to many schools. So helping through my mentorship and training program, helping the youth to excel and to elevate to get them to that next place. But then I also women and men who were battling obesity and emotional issues, that Go Elite athletic program, it was more than just, well, come out here and do some jumping jacks. It was counseling um, mm -hmm. to a degree, you know, uh, shaping, reshaping their self-image and their uh, self-esteem and helping them lose weight. Countless people across the city have benefited from that particular service. And then you started seeing, I'm not saying I was the only one, but you started seeing people, a fitness movement in the city start picking up in a training movement. People, everybody wanted to train kids at this point. Now you want, everybody wants to train for football. And I, I could, I knew I was a track guy and I was a speed guy, but a lot of my, some of my closest friends had gone to the NFL. And when I was at Arkansas, uh, people like uh, actually um, Eddie Jackson, who is a chef now on the Food Network, he was like my roommate for a year and a half. We used to have cooking competitions, <laughs> but he played cornerback in the NFL. I say that to say this: Did many of those, he played for the Dolphins. He played for the New England Patriots. Okay. Uh, he was a starter for the Razorbacks for several years, and so I have all these fun not only memories but actual connections with these individuals and it helped me to train our local football players uh, and then use the track to help with these other things so that was the service I was providing and then out of nowhere I got a call just from a someone I met at Jack Roby um, and say what do you think about um, do you think you could be uh, a parks and recreation director. I was like, well, I never thought about it, but I'm sure I could. What, what do they do? And she's <laughs> like, well, everything that you already do, except for the XXX, I so look at this job description. I looked at it. I said, well, I probably could, you know, I'm working for myself. I'm doing well, but I know it can be more that I can do in the community. So let's try it. I put it in, got an interview and Mayor Washington, it's like, you're the guy we're looking for uh, who can engage the youth, create youth programming, background in sports, and a, I say a linchpin within the community because I work with these different generation of both youth and older people. So it was kind of a perfect fit. It fit like a glove. And that's how I ended up at Parks and Recreation. The you know, track. just the, your, um, good vibe for track and fitness. Um, yesterday I was at the, the, the high school track, the old, the old track, mm -hmm. you know, and the uh, UAPB goes out there and trains. Uh, then here come, this is a fresh group of guys and I've never seen them out there. You know, the basketball was like, is this baseball? And they said, no, this is track. So he's got them out there doing sprints, four guys at a time. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, the larger guys are over doing shot puts and, and discus. Yeah. And it was so funny because they started 
jawing with each other. Yeah. And and before long, the the big guys were over and, and they and you know they got different shoes on, so they like took they were down to their socks. Oh yeah. And they were running sprints with these against these other guys. And I thought, what a great what great camaraderie, you know. It's like they're not built for 200 yard dash or 100 yard dash, but there they were out there and and just keeping up with them pretty well. <laughs> you know, it speaks to two things. Number one, track is the ultimate uh, competitive sport, and it's, it's mano y mano. Yep. Either I'm better than you or I'm not. Yep. Either I'm trained or untrained, right? Uh, nobody blocking for me, no one passing, no off shots. You and the clock. And me and the clock. Yeah. And But those guys are so competitive, and the competitive nature that still remains in Pine Bluff is so important. I mean, we can see that through this race. You you got six people running for mayor, and um, it's very qualified um, competitors, if you will. Uh, oh, yeah, that's why we're here. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's filled, and I said this before, it's filled with excellence. It What it does is it shows that, no, they're – there's some good pieces in Pine Bluff. There's excellence here. There's greatness here. It continues. See, some people kind of um, make me out to be this guy who's uh, selling something that's not. Well, that's not all the way accurate. That's not accurate at all. I'm just a person that believes in glass half full, okay, and that you can put more water on top of it. There's some good, there's more than good. There's great. Look at the great things that Pine Bluff has produced. And I know most people would expect me to go right to the Tory Hunters and the, yeah, but I can start talking about Dr. Glover Collins, my sister, who is a surgeon at the University of Washington in St. Louis. She runs her own surgical clinic. I can talk about Dr. Brandy Wright, who has come back home to be, who's a Pine Bluff zebra. She's come back home over the nephrology, over JRMC. You know, we can talk about Dr. Glenn Bar uh, Brown, Jr., chiropractor, uh, minority chiropractor in this city. We could talk about a lot of success. Rowe family, take your pick of the Rowe family. Exactly. Like, oh, the Supreme Court Justice, yeah, we got that. You got that. I mean, and Sissy, uh, 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 Bill Jones, and, and, and all of them, listen, there's a lot of success to be talked about, but there's also excellence. And I believe what this field does is it displays that we have it there. And I think the real question is who's the leader? Who's the person that can be the change agent and can lead this city into the next phase and also to pull the next generation in, into not, not only leadership roles, but into a place where they're being productive and prosperous citizens. So of all the people, now I don't know Mr. Is it Washington? Is that the? Charles Washington. Sorry, Washington. Mm -hmm. I don't know him, but I know the rest of the folks who are, who are running. Um, I'd say your entry into the race surprised me. Um, why you? Why now? Well, it came down to, and I knew, I really knew in about 2019 that you know, in 24, um, I may have enough experience in municipal government to be able to to take on a task like that because, like the leadership quality, as I've spoken about, that's always been in my life. The impact in the community, I've always been interested in and I've actually done the work for, you know, even since I was 16 years old, doing things in the community. And so in 19, I knew Mayor Washington was running again in 20, and I supported her 150% because not only did she hire me, I believed in what she was doing. And I said, well, she'll do eight years, and then in 24, we'll be looking for the next generation of leaders all the way across the city and the county in general. That's in education, businesses, all of it. And I said, well, I'll, I'll probably you know, look at what that would look like in 24, not knowing that all of these things would transpire. Um, this has been a traumatic last 18 year, uh, 18 months or two years. It has in our city, but it never deterred me. And the final thing when um, I resigned my position in February 
multifaceted, but you know, my wife, the day I came in and said, I'm resigning, she was glad about it. And it took me back a little bit because I'm like, now hold on now. You know, I'm the breadwinner. We just had a, a newborn, had a barely one year old daughter. She said, this job is killing you. Hmm. So I'm like, no. She's like, you give everything, literally. And you know, it's true. Three, four o'clock in the morning, she know I, I would get up and drive around the city and look at the, the new landscaping that we just inserted, see how we can do it better. Trying to see, you know, our people hanging around in areas and how we can improve the safety in those parks. And I was totally immersed in parks and recreation and with the collaborate the with the collaboration of the of the different groups and how it all connected because when I again when I initially came to Parks and Recreation I really didn't know much about that particular thing but I had the ancillary experiences that would you know align with that but when I got into it I saw how well wow this impacts economic community development I have to partner with the police department for my events and for other activities. I, the fire department is vital with when we do X, Y, Z, code enforcement. So I've literally partnered or done, I made it my point to do business, actual business with every department in the city every year. And just regularly, you know, talking to any department head or anyone who's been a department head during my time as Parks and Recreation, they knew who to call. Call Sam Glover. You need something done, call Glover. Not that I was the only person, but they knew that I was always an open door to assist them in what they need. You say, well, how would you help in the cemetery department? Well, we had trailers. We had small tractors. This is the city. Ms. Brown called and said, hey, listen, do you have a trailer? We trying to move come get it. Hey, we know you have a small Kubota, you know, because they can't bring the big tractor out there to tear the graves up. Well, you know, this happened and ours went down, whatever. Do you have this? Yeah. Do that. And so having that camaraderie amongst the department heads really, really uh, affected uh, my confidence, if you will, in looking back again saying, why do I run for, want to run for mayor? Can I run for mayor? Am I even qualified for this? And and then finally, the the ultimate why. I looked at my children's faces. I have a nine year old, an eight year old, and a two year old. And it's like it came to me and said, the future is now. There's no building for four and eight more years of the same type of situation and all. You know, I saw the infighting and all of this people grasping for position and power. And I'm out of the way at this point, way out of the way, and I'm not trying to do any of those things. And uh, I looked at my children, I said, if I don't stand up in this community right now on their behalf, the behalf of every mentor, mentee that I have, and just, just in general, I'm looking at my parents, 73 years old, retired, what are their lives gonna look like? At 77. Here. They're here. They're here. Um, active in the community. My mom's been active in uh, volunteerism for over 45 years. Okay? Um, dad's the same. You know, when we opened the community garden and we couldn't get people, we couldn't, could we talk about a food desert? And we have one. On Cherry Street? Yeah, we opened up, we opened that up. Yeah. That was, you know, uh, you all own within that the first, oh, that the city does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I was getting to this point about the food desert and about the volunteers, and it all comes together. When we opened that during my first year as parks director, we were trying to create this program to seed to table community garden. And so I was in charge of creating the program that the kids used, okay? And so we were, what we were gonna do is walk from the community center over to the community garden, teach them how to plant from C, et cetera. And then that's why, one of the reasons why we designed the um, 
community center, the rent of the restoration of the community center, we designed it that way intentionally to have a cooking, I mean a teaching kitchen. So the purpose right. was to connect the programming. Walk over here, that's the obesity, all that. So we get the exercise. We teach them how to plant, we teach them how to harvest, we walk the food back to the kitchen, teach them how to cook it, partnering with the 4-H club and Pia Woods, et cetera, Tiki Hunt, teach them how to do it. And then, and then we bring the parents in and do the same thing. So we had this program we were working. We couldn't get people to work to, to, to do the plots. My dad came in and took over 10 or 12 of the plots to grow food for the community and just let them have it. And couldn't even, couldn't even get them to, to take free corn and greens and bell sure what to do with a potato. It's, it's really interesting because this community, the data shows that this is a fast food community. We like to get our food, get it fast, eat it in the car, and go home. So when we talk about how we can improve both tourism and, and the economic value of our community through restaurants and things of that nature, there, 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 it is a viable uh, thing that we do need it. There's a necessity there, but we have to also understand where we are as a community, and we have to change some of that culture because most people are going to do what. Get something quick, eat it in the car, and then on the weekends they're gonna cook. They're not gonna go to a meal. My, my again, my brother mm -hmm. lives in Washington D.C. My sister lives in St. Louis. They go out to eat at least three times a week, minimum. That's not our culture here, but that doesn't mean we don't need new business here and things of that nature. But I'm saying we have to have a balance. It's back to that balance I'm talking about. I always thought we with so many vacant lots and. We're, we got more now than we had is turn those vacant lots into community gardens, but I guess it's I mean easier said than done. It is, and uh, and maybe there's not that much interest. You know, the USDA is I don't want to say struggling; they're very challenged in NRCS. They're very challenged across the country right now, trying to get urban farming. In urban forestry off the ground, trying to because there again that disconnect. Remember, I'm going back to when I talked about that foundational, those foundational skills and critical thinking and things of that nature. That's been taken out of the community and replaced it completely, replaced with technology instead of being enriched with technology. So when you have a child that can't, this is relatable. You have a child that can't swim because we don't have a, a summer sports program, but then you do that for about 20 years, you created kind of almost two generations of kids that's lacking a certain life skill for survival. And you multiply that time, you know, 20 different facets of life that they're missing out on that that previous generation received, and you that's where the learning the learning, you're having a problem in the schools because you have these teachers trying to teach a child that's lacking certain skills because in their home, there's some things that they need to be undergirded in. Now, we're not trying to tell people how to raise their kids, but we're saying, pause, let us give you a little more information so that you can enrich your child to help them be more productive in this world because they're getting left behind because of basic skills and the mm -hmm. You know the the test scores and all of the data from from the study that they did that shows seventy five percent of our children in Jefferson County uh, are at a place of almost illiteracy. That's absurd. How do we combat that? Well, we start that by more resources into youth programming, as I talked about in my pillars, collaborations equal prosperity for Pine Bluff. This is why we need to promote youth services and undergird them and galvanize them with resources. You know that when I came into Parks and Recreation, there was zero dollars allocated for youth programming. And I said, this has got to be an anomaly. <laughs> so I went Sorry. all the way back to previous administrations. I looked at the budgets. 
Never any money for you. Zero program. dollars. Now they'll try to say, oh, it was this. I'm looking at the line item. This says zero every year, every year. So got in and fought hard for it. In the first year, we got 20000 The next year, sixty. Steady pumping it out. Before I left, we had over $100,000 specifically for youth programming. That seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? It does. But what they were doing, it's really counterintuitive. Get this, get these youth, you know, and let's get this programming done. Well, we don't have any funding. Make it happen. Use volunteers. It's not the same. People want to be paid for their services and paid for their time. And it, to pay somebody creates a, de, a level of dependability. You it know, does. It's like you're responsible for this. Well, that's why, that's why I, as the Parks Director, we saw that dynamic changing. And some of your volunteers, listen, they need a break. They're doing everything. You go to these events, same people working hard too. And they've been doing it for 40 years. They need fresh legs. It's time for them to be able to relax. They shouldn't have to fight the school board battle. They shouldn't have to fight for us to be consolidated in Pine Bluff. That should be a no-brainer, but that's because leaders from younger generations are not stepping up. And that's another reason I had to step up and say, now I am a leader in this community and I am in this generation, I have to step up to lead the, and if I have to lead the charge, that's fine, because I believe the city should spearhead a lot of efforts you know, within the city, it, using that platform to do that. So, four years ago, give or take, uh, you said you supported Shirley Washington 150%. Yes, I did. What is that? What does your inclusion in this race say about where you think Shirley Washington, Washington is today? Well, You're not living up to your expectations? Well, I think the expectation has been exhausted, if you will. Um, from the standpoint, I, I'm different in that I have new ideas, fresher ideas. I believe my vision for the city is more inclusive of everyone's input, if you will. And again, I did not expect, it was actually shocking for me that she decided to run for a third term. I, I was a little surprised too. Uh, you know, and. It, but I, at that point... Because I think she had made noise like she wasn't going to. She, she wasn't, and she was. But, you know, again, I'm the entire time saying, well, I'm going to do this. Uh, and, again, I didn't even know the process. I'm like, okay, when does this even happen? So then I finally got the information <laughs> November. And so when, you know, these different people started coming out, I knew all along. It's like in November I'm going to announce no matter who is there because it was impressed upon my heart in so many ways. Um, and I'm a prayerful man and a man of faith and I put my faith on it long before I even announced this is going to happen and so I knew that safety collaboration and development was going to equal prosperity for Pine Bluff because I've been in the engine I've been outside of the engine and just these different facets of why it's necessary in the city uh, so question or two about go forward um, you know I think the purpose hopefully the purpose of forums and debates and these interviews is to give put some space between candidates oh she likes this he likes this I, mm -hmm. I prefer this guy because he um, so I've always I've been asking the go forward question um, They have made, uh, they have not made clear that they're going to be around. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, they, they've not said we're, we're packing up and going away. Um, in the back of my mind, I think, well, if they haven't said they're going away, then maybe they're not. They're, are not, they're, they're going to try 
try to stick around. Um, would uh, wh where do you stand on go forward? Anyway? I mean, were you a supporter? Are you still a supporter? If you're the mayor, would you give up? Would you vote to help them put uh, their preferred tax on the ballot if you were around in November? You know, <clears throat> that, was three, that was three questions, I think. Right, and so let me go with the first one. Yes, in 2017, I, again, before I even went to government, I supported uh, the quote-unquote go for it Pine Bluff movement uh, because I think sometimes it gets jaded into, well, this organization um, or this, you know, this entity versus this entity versus, and we created factions in the city, and that's where the divide is coming. We created factions. Now it's this go forward. Yeah, yeah but what it really is, what in my opinion, in 2017, it was a movement of saying we're going to try to do something. This is our last stance as a city. And coincidentally, we have to lot. have an organizational piece to actually implement a public-private partnership. A lot of people said, "Well, thank God somebody's doing something." Yeah, so it was more of that. So I was, and then if you look up and you got uh, Dr. Wiley running through the streets campaigning. I actually met him out there one day because uh, I was looking on social media and I'm like, "This is Wiley out here," and you know, it's a funny story. I'm not going to get too far off the path, but. See, I trained Dr. Wally for oh, did you? Uh, one year. Well, one summer, he was with uh, another athlete of mine, Martel Mallet, and he, you know, because he was a good football player at, U at UAPB. Wally was, and he came up one day when we were training, and he said, "I'm gonna work out with y'all for the rest of the summer," and we worked out, and you know, he great work ethic. He was a hard worker, and so I just fast forward and looking in 2017, I hadn't seen him since he went to you know Oklahoma to get his PhD. I said, this is Wadley running through here. What is this go for business? Because, again, I'm immersed in what I'm doing. I ain't even thinking about that. And he's like, and I, and I went to some of the meetings. And then one of those days he was running, and I, I met him on, on Olive Street, and I ran with him all the way down to the courthouse. And uh, I was inspired. I was inspired by what he was doing because, what, what again, it's not an organization for me. It, it was a movement and saying, we're going to do something, all right? And so I supported it greatly. And when I saw that, the, the quality, I looked at the pillars. The quality of life pillar, again, fast forward, now I'm the parks director. Parks and Recreation is inside of this pillar. So they were allocating funds for things to happen in the park. So what I'm going to say, well, we're not partnering with you guys. It makes no sense because... Through that initiative, you've got mistletoe magic. We brought ice skating to Pine Bluff. Now, people say, well, it wasn't even real ice. I have the videos to prove that <laughs> those, you know, there was a big fight in the, in the city council. Like, we don't need this mistletoe. And we went to every school. And, the, and I said, do y'all want to have ice skating in Pine Bluff? Those kids were like, yeah, I'm going crazy. And we went out there, and the whole community came out there. And we tried to elevate it a few times. It was cold, but it was something different. It was at least trying to push the needle and say, we got to do something, right? So this is 18, 19, 20. They're still doing it, but it's a really scaled down version of it. King Cotton, that's quality of life stuff. Again, I aligned with everything that was in the quality of life pillar for Go For It Pine Bluff. And I, I saw what was happening, urban renewal and these other things. And so I understood the plan. I actually understood it. And so, yes, I did support it. And I believe they did great things in the community. But with any plan, right? Didn't President Obama come up with the Affordable Care Act? They call it Obamacare. Everybody does need health insurance. But guess what? It was some things in there that need to get tweaked after we ran, the, ran it for a little while. Same situation. Every plan has room for improvement. And I think what we did in this community is we created factions and we demonized the organization instead of focusing on the movement of progress in the city. And I didn't want anything to do with that uh, because I'm a, I, was, I was a card-holding NAACP member. 
Then I started seeing some of that. I said, I refuse to continue in this. And it had nothing to do with we're against go for it. It was this organization is was not founded to do this type of um, what I felt was weaponizing this organization to go against another organization. That's not what the NLACP is supposed to be doing. And I support nationally what that organization does. Like I said, I was a card holding member, but I would not be a part of that type of uh, behavior. Okay? And so moving right along, if I'm elected mayor, um, I'm with any organization, citizen, or business that is trying to make a positive impact in the city. And people want me to just, are you going to support Go For It? Again, you're talking about an organization. These are citizens. Is it? Are the people who work for Go For It Pine Bluff citizens of Pine Bluff or not? Are the individuals at NAACP and Watson Chapel and Pine Bluff and the Pine Bluff School District and and small business, are those not citizens? I am concerned with the citizens of Pine Bluff. And we have to stop the division. The divisiveness has just gotten to an all-time high. And it, nothing good can come of it. I think that we need to lay aside those differences and find common ground. That's what I believe. Before we leave the subject, do you, do you think that they will be back again to try? <laughs> From the standpoint, like as a tax and them being able to manage the tax? Yeah. Yeah, I believe that from this standpoint, it's a clear distinction. I, I believe they've said there's a clear distinction. The reason for the public private partnership was so that they could use the private funds for things like education and those retention programs for the officers and EM, EMT, like that is important. So in the ALICE program, things they were trying to do to better the quality of life in the city. Like that's what the private funds are supposed to be for. And that's, I mean, from, from what I'm seeing, that's what they were spending on. The tax dollar was for city projects. And I, I believe what the, the chasm was was that the, the the city council felt like well, the city departments can do what you're doing, but I will say this: um, I think what Go For Pine Bluff, the movement and the organization proved in our city is that we were lacking some logistical support to carry out the mission of Pine Bluff, which is to be progressive. We were lacking some logistical support. We did need support. And it's proof that the public-private partnerships in general, talking about nationwide, are vital and people want them. I was a speaker at a national parks and recreation uh, conference in Phoenix in 2022. And I was a speaker and they wanted me to speak on public-private partnerships. Because again, Parks and Recreation was under the Quality of Life Pillar, so I had done a lot of work with them. Right. Plus, being dual director with the King, see, King Cotton and Parks and Recreation are separate. So that's two totally separate situations. And I was actually King Cotton director before I was Parks and Recreation. And Don't so, worry. yeah, and so I've done Ford Fest twice. Uh, Renovating, you know, they spent money was spent through the GFPB or the 2017 sales tax to to put those seats out at Townsend Park and Regional Park and you know the aquatic uh, well aquatic center, but the Splash Park and other little mm -hmm. things that it was used for. When I was in Phoenix, everybody wanted to know how do you guys do this public private? You know, we need this in our city. This is Fresno, Columbus. All of these cities are like crowding the table like, hey man, tell us how or what steps we need to take to have a public partnership in our city because we need to move forward in this manner as well. And so I see that it is vital, but we need to find out in our city how we can do it and do it, you know, 
uh, both legally and have the fiduciary responsibility in place and the accountability transparency. You know, everybody's saying those things, but when you're, there is a great level, and this is not in, I want to say this because I think it's important. This is not for or against, like in defense of, that's not what this is. I'm saying we need to make sure that our information that we are giving to our community is accurate and that it is forthcoming and it's, you know, truthful. That's important because misinformation is, it, it does no one any good because not a, it just doesn't. And that's one of the reasons why I want to have a communications and marketing department uh, that solely focuses on those issues to give, give the community consistent information. And what I'm saying by that, I, I bring that up to say this, every dollar of the public tax dollar in 2017 sales tax is accounted for you can go look at it. They don't have to, I mean, just FOI. It's in the finance department. It's online, City of Palm Bluff. The budget is there. Go to the clerk's office and pull the receipts. They're in there. They can't, they can't do certain things. No more, they can't do any more than say, the director of transit. They still have to put that document or whatever they're doing mm -hmm. into New World. That's the system they use, the programs. And it goes through these processes to even spend money. And it's well documented. You have to know um, how that process works. And you just need to go and ask. And many people say, well, no, they need to tell us. Well, every department is in there and for the sake of the conversation gfpb as an organization not as a movement was more or less a another department de facto if you will within the city because they couldn't move money without approval of the council and the budget and all that so it's like let's get some let's let's lay it all out and say this is where it is and now let's fix this, let's fix this, 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 and this. And if you choose to want to stay as an organization in this city, well, these are the things that we need to do to make that be uh, so some, successful. So some tweaking, yeah. but overall... What anything, because yeah. let's say we, let's, let's just say this hypothetically. We do away with the organization, the movement, all of it. And we come up with a new program called, I don't know, uh, Pine Bluff is first in our eyes, right? And then what are they going to do? They're going to go and they're going to get some of the stuff out of the 2020 plan. And they're going to go get some of the go for Pine Bluff stuff. They're going to go get some things out of the, the master plan. And they're going to put a little sprinkle of their own stuff in there. And it's just going to be a conglomerate of the other 10 plans that we already have present. That's what it's going to be. But then who's going to do the work? Because one thing I can tell you for sure, and this is just from an objective standpoint. It's some work getting done by some people. Um, they're working really hard. And that's why I speak about King Cotton and it's because it's separate from the city and I get an opportunity to work with them hand in hand. That's a lot of work that you don't get to see. And many people don't want anything to do with that. When we start talking about going to work and you, you have to do the brain work three o'clock in the morning and you're trying to get these things down and then you are negotiating and doing these different things. People don't want to do all that. They just want the finished product. Microwave society. <laughs> so before we leave your time at the Parks and Rec, um, I want to ask you about the uh, money handling. Yeah. Um, you know, I was looking up a story to refresh my memory several of the things that landed the city with the legislative audit came out of Parks and Rec. Uh, 500000 for for this. It didn't go through the right way. It was just a, a, some bullets of, of things. And it toward the end of that story, which E. Plumas sitting here wrote, um, you said you were cool with it all. That, yeah. that it was, um, well, that's, that's not what you said, actually, but it was something like that. Like, I'm, I'm totally 
at peace with, with yeah, I'm fine. my time at the, but yet those things happen under your watch. Can, can you explain Absolutely. that period and what happened? Yes, I will. So first of all, let me explain my comment. I was good with it because there had been a cloud of misinformation and deception that had been placed out concerning my department and my name literally saying I misappropriated funds and that I then it got to he's taking kickbacks then it got to he's stealing money and I'm like this is absurd but I held my peace because I knew I hadn't done any of those things and so when the audit came out there's not one word in there that says misappropriate anything so then I'm supposed to so so I have to look at this and say wait a minute so we have a group of individuals who want the city of the citizens of Pine Bluff to believe that their word of misappropriation, theft, and mishandling money somehow supersedes the state legislative audit, and this is all they do every day, all day, and they're in our city downstairs at the city hall for six to seven months out of the year, and they do this every year for every city in the state, and we supposed to take your word over what they're saying, document it on paper with an Arkansas seal? That's insane. But they double down on it. No, you misappropriated funds. Misappropriation means that you have spent money on something that you were not supposed to spend it on, that it was not allocated for. The $500,000 contract came from a line item in Harbor Oaks to pay for leased golf equipment. That's not a misappropriation of funds. The reason that I went forward with the contract is because I received counsel to do so. Okay? When like city attorney counsel? You know, there are many people involved in the process, okay, when you get ready to do a contract, but let's just, allow me to put a pin in that just for a moment so that you can know the duties of a department head legally by the state through the municipal code. We have authority to enter into contracts. They've since changed some things within our city code, but we, if you go into the, the city of Palm Bluff city code, you'll see that many of our things say, refer to the Arkansas municipal code. Within the Arkansas municipal code, the, the, the department has, has authority as an, uh, as an authorized representative of the city. And the mayor, I had authority to do the contract. I've done plenty of them, not, not just me, but people before me in my position, other department heads in the city, they have authority to enter into contracts. We have uniform contracts. We have gasoline contracts, oil. You know how many things go into running a city department? So the mayor would not, it, it would not be efficient or conducive for a mayor to look at every contract that every department head in the city is doing. It is impossible. You couldn't get any work done. So that's why that delegated authority is there. I was tasked to get Harbor Oaks back on track. Harbor Oaks was never owned by the city. Right. All right. So when we came into ownership of it, it was my understanding, and we were all building the plane while it was flying because it was happening kind of quickly. It was my understanding that when we took over that, we took over everything. That's the bills, the equipment. Everything pertaining to Harbor Oaks is our responsibility, including 56 golf carts under lease that are all torn up and broken. And then it's my job to try to get it back online. I've just inherited a 276 acre golf course on my watch with no money and no employees. Okay? No revenue coming in. No revenue. So I go into solution mode, into action. The first thing I did, I brought in specialists to do a survey on the, on the course and to show me what we needed. I brought them in from Chicago and from Georgia. They came in, gave me a full plan. I delivered that to the Public Works Department where Ivan Whitfield was the chairman. 
they knew everything that we were doing, which was brought me, it kind of took me aback when they started acting like they had no idea what was going on. Please, I'm telling, I'm, I'm updating you and letting you know we're moving forward and where I may have been a little overzealous, I may have been a little overzealous in telling them we're gonna get this thing on track in July. We acquired it in March, and of course everybody's like, "How are you gonna pull this off?" Because I'm a worker. I'm gonna I'm gonna have the tenacity to do this. So this is what I did. After we brought the specialists in, because uh, this is kind of right there in budget time and all this different stuff, we got the funds allocated to try to do an overhaul of the greens, all these different things. So now let's talk about the golf carts. They're in bad condition. They've gone through a flood in 2019, which is why the course was messed up anyway. And I said to, I called the company, I got in, got in touch with the company, and I said, listen, because again, my understanding of the lease and the, all of that, the acquisition is that you're responsible for these carts now, buddy. And I said, well, we're not paying for these. You know, if this lease, we have to pay for a lease. We're not paying for any busted up carts. They said, no, no, we'll give you brand new carts straight out of the plastic, you know, and we'll just renew the lease like this, et cetera. I said, oh, this is a good deal. Because you, if you had to buy those, that's not a good, that's not good. That's the same reason you don't buy golf carts. That is not good business. That's not a good business practice because, again, I'm calling Chennault Valley. I'm calling all over the country. I to some golf carts. Yeah, what do you do? We lease them. Then the gentleman, uh, Mr. Wilson, he who, who owned it, he showed me the books from 2017. Do you know they had played almost 14,000 rounds of golf out there? I'm doing the math. 14,000 times $40 a round. That's almost $600,000. That's not, that's no tournament. You haven't you haven't done any tournaments like the Budweiser tournament and this the, the alumni tournament. You have you haven't done any of that. You haven't rented the building. You haven't done any night golf. Who was the woman who used to run that? Thomas, something like yeah. that. Now yeah. she put on some tournaments because she would always call me up and say, "Can you come out and cover?" Right. So you haven't done any of that, and you've made six hundred thousand dollars just mm -hmm. off of the cars were five hundred. This is good business because we'll pay for these in one year and we're moving on and we don't have to pay for maintenance. It's got a GPS on it. Ask a golfer, do they want a GPS system on it? So they were state of the art carts at a reasonable price. I had the authority to, to execute the contract. I had made it clear that these are the things I was going to do. I think where the problem came is because I was moving so fast at a rate that they were not, when I say they, individuals on the public works and the mayor, they were not comfortable with how fast I was moving because you've got all this business going on in the city. I'm in parks and recreation in my lane, literally doing my job. I'm moving at a very rapid pace to do what I said I was gonna do. So no, after I've said, we're gonna get some golf carts and we're gonna do this, this, and this, that's exactly what I'm getting ready to do. I'm not going to come back and check 26 times. I, that's just not how I operate. It's like, we've had this conversation. We've had it twice. I've talked about it. It's, it's done. I'm going. And I have the authority to do it. So that's where that came in. And so on the contract, finally, I did ask the attorney right before, what should I do as far as how do we get these old cars into new? He said, well, what they're trying to do is an assumption. And it means exactly what it sounds like it means. We assume this contract mm -hmm. and everything under it and we get a new one. And that's how that laid out. I signed it, my office manager signed it because on the contract it says the, the, uh, the clerk of record, not the city clerk, the clerk of record, she's my clerk of record because you have to remember that Parks and Recreation was under a commission at first and they used to do their own checks and their own stuff. So the office manager is actually the clerk of record in Parks and Recreation and still in its infantile stage of coming under the city. 
So we really are operating under our auspicious to do. We're just moving at a rapid pace and it's like, well, wait, wait, what's going on? We're handling business is what we're doing and not talking a thing to death. And I think that's one of the issues within our city government and why there's a lot of stalling is because it's too much talking after we've already talked. Hmm. If we've talked about this two, three, four times now, what do we need to talk about? We need to get to work. And that's what Sam Glover was doing. And I think that I think that it kind of came into a place where I don't like golf. I don't like Harborough, so I don't like what you're doing. I don't like how you're spending this money. Well, that doesn't mean it's not necessary or viable in the city. It certainly doesn't mean I've done anything illegal. The le- the legislative audit proves that. So then it turns into, well, let's just audit him, period. Do it. I've never shied away from an audit. I love it. I audit myself. Because the reason I said that I'm fine with it, audits tell you what you're doing wrong. See, it's the spirit behind why you do a thing. When most people hear audit, they get a little shaken, like, oh, what's wrong? I don't. I say, tell me what's wrong so we can fix it, not gotcha, look what you did. That's, that's no way to treat people. That's no way to operate business in the city. We're trying to get better and better and progress. So when they start talking about, well, there's more than one audit, I know that there's an operational audit and asset audit and forensic audit. We know that. But do we really want to spend 50000 30000 however much money you're trying to do this independent person to do an audit that the internal auditor can do? So then some people say, well, that person is under the mayor. So now we're going to insult the professionalism and the abilities and the skill of a individual who has been working in internal audits for over 30 years. Now she's com- now this person is compromised by the mayor when she's been under three mayors doing the same work and you have the legislative I like that's not adding up. You're you're referring to the the cry over, let's get a, 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 um, a forensic audit. Forensic audit. But we can do forensic audits. I've done them on myself. This is how this is how simple it is. We have a budget report. Any city council member, really any citizen, through a FOI. But let's just talk about this council, mayor, department head situation because there's a separation of powers and different, et cetera. We have a budget performance report. Office manager of any department in the city can print it off just like that. It'll show you dollar for dollar, nickel for nickel, right there. The percentage that you spent for your budget for the year, it's got all of these different lines in it. Let's put that to the side, print that off. Then you print out an accounts payable. It show you every person that has gotten a check from your department every dollar spent, every uh, check number, that's right in the New World system. You go, it's, that's a hundred some pages, you get that. Then, it actually has the receipts in it, but let's just, for the sake of this conversation, the, the city clerk, and this is something that I would like to change, it's archaic over there. They're still scanning in paper invoices. This is the city of Pine Bluff in 2024, and we're scanning in individually invoices from every department every single week. You can go and get a copy of all of those for all of that. And all you gotta do is say, does this match? There go your forensic audit right there. You don't have to go pay uh, Bill Moss in George Steps, uh, extra $25,000, $30,000 to do what the internal auditor is already doing. You're insulting her intelligence, you're insulting her job, and you're saying she can't do her job, but she's functioned in her job for over 30 years. That's disrespectful in itself. And it is a, in my opinion, it's misinformation to say that this is not right and we need to do something else when it's already there. And I would like to just make note of this, Byron. Knowing how the city municipal government 
in general runs, and especially from, see, I was an executive director, okay? So, like, the people who are candidates of this, they don't have this experience. None of them can say they had this experience. Not even the mayor, from this standpoint that I'm gonna say. The mayor can't spend money. Not like that. The department heads are the ones who are entering into contract, doing business, the day-to-day -day operations of the department heads are doing that in their team. And so I have that experience. And we, when the production picked up in Parks and Recreation, do you realize we were doing 100 invoices a week? What do you mean the production picked up? We were renovating, we were upgrading, we were doing programs, we were doing business. Uh, let, me, let me illuminate a little bit more. One of the things that, what I would say, Glover, you need to slow down. But well, they were saying that because they didn't realize what I was doing. I was trying to get us back up to a standard because we had gone so low, trying to get back to a standard. 33 parks and facilities. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of grass. It's a lot of rotten wood inside of facilities. It's a lot of everything you can think of. So this is what 100 invoices would look like. It looks like saying, let's, let's go to the RV park and let's have the RV park cut. We don't have the staff, Parks and Rec does not have the staff to cut all of these facilities and make it look like it's supposed to look in Pine Bluff. I was really big on that. You've got six, I don't care if you have 14 people, you would need 14 people, 14 mowers, you know, seven trucks. That's a lot of money. So what I did as a solution is I started contracting out. I bid them all out. I bid at every park out and broke them down into pieces so that we can utilize one of the strengths of Pine Bluffs, which is the small business community. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let's bid them out. And I had 10 different small businesses cutting different parks around the city because the whole goal was all parks facilities should look the same every day of the week. So some parks, you know, I had done my research and I had looked at everything so some parks grow faster than others etc so this is what the hundred looks like you've got 10 groups some of them are cutting twice a week you've got ADC coming in to help clean up Harbor Oaks out there well they gotta eat and so then we gotta go to Richie's or Thomas Groceries <laughs> no seriously and feed them that's part of the deal. Huh? That's, yeah, that's part of it. Then you have to, um, then over at Chester Hines, you've got the ceiling falling through. And then we've got, we've got to buy the towel, right? That's an invoice. You need the contractor that's going to do the work. Oh, he found an electrical problem. Okay, call the electrician. You know, pipe busted at, burst at Townsend Park. Now we got that person over there. Well, did you know we were doing a, we were building a fence at Townsend Park too for the best, a totally different group of people. So you got all these different groups and that, that's not to even mention your 30 electric bills, 30 water bills, really 50 something water bills because parks and recreation is taking care of way more in the city than people may realize. That whole situation downtown, that uh, streetscape, we planted that. Well, replanted it after they put the wrong plants in. It was just, you remember that? And it was just out of control. Sort of a yeah. desert scape. Right. And, uh, you know, Mayor was like, listen, there's an issue here, et cetera. I said, I'll take it on, Mayor. I would always take on the tough projects that needed to be done for the city. Um, and we had the flexibility to do it. And so we went down there and planted all the new stuff that's down there low profile, beautiful, to beautify our city. But then the water system, the sprinkler system mm -hmm. over there, that's parks and recreation paying those bills. You know, you know how many water uh, bills are coming out of regional park alone? 
That's not just the building or Harbor Oaks. That's sprinkler systems. That's out at the amphitheater. Like, it's way more business going on. And Parks and Recreation is the third largest um, department, really, in the city as far as employees are going. And I would dare to say probably the top department when it comes to the operational pieces because you're dealing again with 33 facilities and you have different functions of every facility two golf courses and it's like you're doing all of this and where I came in is I challenged my team to do more and we were pumping out more because I'm not even talking about how we began to the like the farmers market and the, the food court Thursdays with, um, our special projects coordinator, Portia Jones, was doing and you know programming where at the youth center where we where we went and hired we went and hired all certified teachers to run our summer program. No more volunteers. Let's get some qualified individuals and counselors and things of that nature to impact the community and to and to um, really help our kids. And so. So, you said thirty-three parks and facilities. Is that does that include Harbor Oaks? Well, thirty-four now. Thank you. Thirty-three on a golf course, which is probably two golf like, courses. Yeah. Um, do we have too many? I've heard that. I mean, we have lost population. We used to be twice what we are. Well, what one of the plans that I would have in coming in really the first, you know, ninety days. 120 days, we need to strengthen, consolidate, and eliminate a lot of things that we have. If it has viable, like, okay, let's just, let's be more forthright. J.C. Jeffries Park, that should be strengthened. That is a community anchor. Central Park, that's a community anchor. It needs to be strengthened. We need to put resources behind and do what we can over there. Mississippi Park, we need to repurpose that. There are no children playing over there. The residents will say, no, we need to keep this. This is, this is something that we need. Well, we see a lot of drug activity, fighting. It's really a hazardous area. We need to either eliminate that or we need to repurpose that. I did have an idea of putting... Uh, some dumpsters over there so they can stop the illegal dumping like using some of those parks that are no longer viable for children to play mm, yeah. or for families to come we repurpose them to maybe recycling areas and if we don't do that we need to just eliminate them all together uh, strengthen consolidate eliminate okay so um, let's talk about crime a little okay. um, we ended up with 28 homicides Last year, 11 of them were teenagers. Uh, puts us at 11 times the national average for homicides uh, and makes us one of the most dangerous cities in the country per capita. Um, what, what can a mayor do to change that? Well, several things. And again, this is a national trend. If we don't impact the youth, we keep hearing it, and people may get tired of hearing it, but it is true. It starts with the with the children. And you, and what, what a mayor can do is break them up into different sections. Through our youth programming in our Parks and Recreation Department, which is in charge of youth programming, collaboration equals prosperity for Palm Bluff. The Parks and Recreation has to create youth programming and collaborate with like the Boys and Girls Club. You know, I was very instrumental in getting the Boys and Girls Club into the Palm Bluff Community Center and some of the council members, some of former council members and some that are on there now. You know, some that are running for mayor were totally against the Boys and Girls Club coming into the Palmer Community Center. I don't understand that thinking. How can we impact the youth if we're not creating an environment for them to be successful in? So we deal with those children at that age level. 
Then we started doing programs through both youth sports. We partnered with youth sports. All of this needs to run through Parks and Recreation. The boxing, baseball, softball, basketball, all of those things are currently happening there. We just need to strengthen those things, right? You know, I'm familiar with a story. Uh, 18-year-old young man mm -hmm. uh, worked at a place, very laid back place um, and and one day he comes to work and he's he's showing his gun mm. that he got and somebody said why do you have a gun and he said to protect myself mm. and they said from what and he said well somebody has a gun and comes after me and it's the you know it's like he's 18 he's working in a place where nobody's gonna come at him with a gun but it's, you know, and it's like, um, no wonder so many young people get killed if, if, if they're, if they're going to carry a gun around for just like, oh, cool. And I, I don't know where he got it, his brother or something, but, it, you know, it just, it was like totally unnecessary, but maybe par for the course. Byron, understanding the culture goes a long way. There's a stigma in communities of color that you have to be armed because it's dangerous in the streets. But Because it's dangerous in the street. I well, might need this gun. Right, but you know what? There are a lot of success stories in inner cities and urban areas where kids, do, you don't have to carry a gun. It's what type of, and this is one of the things that I talk to um, the, the children, but specifically Palm Bluff High's football teams. I've, I've, I've gone over over to the campus and spoken to them multiple times, and my mentees in general, especially the younger ones. What does your environment look like? You have to be mindful of who is in your circle and what you're actually doing. There are plenty of kids out here that don't own a gun. They don't carry a gun. They're not around people with guns. They're active in the community. They're doing things. It is a choice, but what we have to do is from young, we're conditioning them to understand to go the other way when there's a fight. We're conditioning them to say, okay, this what you're listening to, this music, um, most of it's not real, you know, but the stigma is making them feel like, well, if I have this gun with a switch on it to turn it into automatic, then I'm empowered. I feel stronger with this. You know, nobody's going to mess with me, you know. But if we teach them self-image and self-esteem and get them involved in sports, extracurricular activities, learning activities, we engage the parents. We have activities in the city for them to do and engage in that are fun, family field activities such as King Cotton. I know that that's just many people see that as an event. But King Cotton's not an event. King Cotton is culture. Because what it does is it shows, it does four things, not limited to, but it shows the teenage kid that there's, that there's an event that I can come to where I don't need to show my weapon or even have one for that matter because I'm here. I came through metal detectors. Uh, it's safe in here. I'm in here with middle-aged white men middle-aged black women, two-year-old children, basketball players, this, that, all of these demographics represented here. And this is fun. This sure is fun. This sure is an exciting time. Then you have people from all over the country saying, this is the best thing that we have ever experienced. And they're coming from Fort Lauderdale. They're coming from Atlanta. They're coming from Los Angeles. And they're saying, we have never, Houston, We've never experienced something like this, and it's in Pine Bluff. It's a branding. King Cotton is Pine Bluff. It's our brand. But if people say, well, what programs? The programs have to be created as an avenue that cultures the children on more levels than what we're doing. I hope that makes sense. And when we pull the strings in, now I've conditioned this K through four 
to a place that now when they're 5A, they have the conditioning that we've been conditioning. That you don't throw things as small that, that we used to say no to drugs, smoke it a bear. That stuff still sticks with us. Don't be a litter bug. Where's all that happening? Well, um, I'm, I've asked some other mayoral candidates. You know, I've, I've got a recording on my phone from December 31st, New Year's Eve, and it's, it, it is like a war zone. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the comments from somebody was, well, that's New Year's Eve, but we hear this every day of the year. Mm -hmm. And I'm, is there a line between the casual use possession and use of a firearm to that 18 year old who casually sticks it in his pocket and goes to it. I mean, because I don't know that, that, you know, there's these programs that you're talking about, but, but do we ever just say, don't do that? Like, say no to guns instead of say no to drugs. Say, you hear you know, that, but we, again, I don't think we ever get on any bully pulpit and say, don't shoot your gun on New Year's Eve or July 4th. You had to understand the culture. It's one of the reasons why people still, okay, people still do fireworks in the city, even though it's a city ordinance that you can't do it. You get on a bully pulpit and say that, but you're dealing with a culture nationwide, worldwide, of a certain type of music. You, We can't turn a blind eye to what they're exposed to and expect them to do something different. What we have to do is... So you think external... external? It is definitely external. They, they have something called... And this is why... I, see, this is why I'm a bridge. I'm the person in this race that's a bridge who brings the generations together. I, I'm relatable to the younger generation. I work with them on a consistent basis. I'm relevant to my own generation, and I resonate with the seniors. I know that there's something called drill music that they listen to a lot. And you pull it up on YouTube and you're like, what is going on? They have access to weapons, high powered weapons, drugs, and access to each other. I it here in Pine Bluff. And they have access to each other that we didn't previously have. When I wanted to try to sneak out of the house at 13, 14, 15, I, I, you know, I didn't never have to sneak out. But if I wanted to do that, I had a phone and I had to wait for it to ring and pick it up fast. These kids can <laughs> email, Snapchat, TikTok, Messenger, Instagram. They can get in touch in school. They can say, Hey, meet me outside. Hey, let's skip class. You couldn't do that at first. You would have to write a note. So we have to be mindful of this and try to assist the parental guidance. But we can't allow the parents to put all of the onus on the city. It's not our responsibility to run your home, but... I believe that we can be responsible in using our platform and our resources to undergird what you're doing at home and give you outlets to help you parent better. You know, on that, on that subject, there was a hearing yesterday, and, and uh, I, know, I know the senators were involved. I guess it was a Senate hearing, but they brought in some people over the social media platform, mm -hmm. and, you know, they're pushing back the social media folks are pushing back on safety regulations, but the lawmakers are saying this this stuff is so toxic and they mentioned a lot of suicides and a lot of social problems brought on because these platforms don't do anything to police their airwaves, whatever you want to call it. And it's, it's freedom of speech. And so what, what yeah. we have to do, what I feel like in a community, our resources. But then I look at what is what what has been done from a state level to get to, to to help our police and fire and our community in general? We haven't seen much to come from a state level to even assist in those ways. So then we have to then you have to come up with things like you know attacks and things of these nature to try to 
help us move forward in some type of way. So again, the violence in the, in the city starts with impacting the youth. But we also, that's preventative. When people say that the police department is not here for prevention. That's not true. Community policing does work. It does work to have youth programs. I remember Officer Norman in, in North Little Rock. That was a big thing. And then people kind of caught on, but then said, no, oh, we need to do something different. Well, no, they need you need relationships. What was Officer Norman at North Little Rock? Officer Norman would go out and shoot basketball with the kids, and they okay. you know, would follow him around, and he would show up with toys and different things. He had a relationship. Relationship does it all. When you talk to these gang violence interventionists, they're able to get them to put the guns down because they know them. Organically, we can do this, which is why I would want to put more resources behind youth job program and training programs. See, we have some things in place, but we're not maximizing, and we need to maximize them, okay? For instance, we at Parks and Recreation during my time had a free summer camp. This business about paying $125, $150 to go to a police pay camp, why, why are our children going to a police pay camp? Is that the way it is now? It's always been that way. That, that program is not free. <coughs> but what was free was the Parks and Recreation program under my watch. <coughs> and what we did was hire qualified teachers, professionals, etc. Then we partnered with different entities in the city that were doing things like archery and cooking and, and things of that nature and sports. And we add our sports to it. And then... We serviced 120 children every summer for free. Were they the kids who used to fill up the pool at UATB? <coughs> are, you, are you saying summertime kids? Back in yeah. That's the new. This is the new summer sports because they, you know, UAP. The summer sports went away because uh, UAPB lost that grant, or well, it stopped being funded. Uh, they didn't lose it. They stopped being funded on a federal level, so they couldn't do the NYSP program anymore, which impacted this community greatly. So then you have this void. So when that void happens, something's going to fill it. And what filled it was a lot of things culturally that are not healthy for children. So we come back with this <coughs> summer program. We did the summer uh, sports and discovery camp. So we're doing this, and then you've got the free swimming in the aquatic program. We would send them to the aquatic center, all these different things. That's for small children. Then we turn around, and the, the middle children is where we were trying to figure out exactly what we need to do. So we started finding other avenues so we would have like a makeup camp. Some people say, oh, that's silly. That's because you're disconnected. You don't realize that makeup, hair, cosmetics, things of that nature is big in this community and uh, culturally. So we started putting on makeup camps to teach those seventh graders up to seventh to twelfth graders how to start their journey of being in cosmetology, right? That That's impact, right? So we're doing those things and then the summer youth job program, it needs to be more than just checking off a box. I worked, see, I worked, my first job in the city of Palm Bluff was with waste management, with wastewater. All right, I was 16 years old, and I got a job at wastewater with David Dean. And, well, with wastewater, but David Dean was my supervisor. And he, they, they worked us. It was hot, and we were putting pipes out there at Tyson and down in Ridgeway Road. They were teaching us a skill. Fast forward. The kids are getting a job, but it has to be more than organizing your desk and cleaning your file cabinets and, you know, a little grunt work. They're sitting around the community center, you know. I said, no, you guys are going to do this, this, and this. You're going to mentor or I'm going to put you in position to mentor these kids. We'll even write some of the scripts that we'll need you to impact the kids with because we're training you to train them and it's this organic feeder system. We have to have it. So back to the youth job program. See, what I would do is 
create a more involved program to where, similar to when I was with the with that program, I was a coordinator in it back in 2012. My first, my second experience working with the city. So I was working under that program, and we started bringing some innovative workshops to train the children. Well, the youth at this point, because we dealt with the children with the, with the free camps. Now we're dealing with that the youth, teenager, adolescents. In that program, I would have them doing stuff like, let's get all of the local banks. And their first check, we're going to come in and do a workshop. They're going to bring in savings account, paperwork, checking account. We're going to show them how to get, make a, an account. And we'll split those people up and they'll go to the various banks and you'll get an account. Then we'll show you how to turn your water on, show you how to turn electric on, show you how to do job applications, how to do all of these things that they're lacking. The city can undergird those. We have the resources to do it. We just need to have the vision to do it. Making a meaningful impact, that's why I'm, that's where I differ because I, I have the executive experience that I've actually done the programs and they worked and have been in position to put the resources where they're supposed to be and that is most impactful to the community. So um, I've asked everybody else, I'll ask you, how's your campaign going? Seeing see, see your signs around, what are your donors saying? We're excited. Campaign's going well. Um, <clears throat> campaigning, any campaign is about the message, the money, and the movement. We know that. And uh, you, 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 it takes money to move things. Uh, we're doing well, but what, uh, several years ago on the federal level, we saw and we know that federal government and municipal government do different things, but some of the same tenets. People start trying to buy elections. This is nothing new, but you start getting, well, we'll pump all of this money in and we'll try to buy our way in. That's not gonna happen in Pine Bluff. Not this time. Not as the people, they're, they're exasperated. They're very tired of a lot of different things, and they are not ignorant at all. They're not jaded. They're not bamboozled in any way, shape, or form. They want a leader, and they want someone who is going to be faithful to the cause and someone who is honest and who is, knows how to do the job. Um, and know how to do it efficiently. And so I bring all that up to simply say that, and this is in every race, some people feel like if I put more money into this, then, you know, we can do this. Or if I do this, you know, mm -hmm. I've had people, you know, when I was getting ready to run, quite honestly, they came to me and said, you shouldn't run. And you, you, need, to stand, you need to stand down because these individuals have are gonna have a bigger war chest than you. And I said, well, that's no reason not to run. My conviction alone is enough for me to stand tall. And that doesn't mean that I don't have people supporting me. My supporters have been great. And my donors have been uh, exceptional and considerate. And, I, and I, I respect all of them and I honor all of them for what they've done. But I'm simply making a point to say that money alone does not win elections and what we have to get away from in this country is allowing that type of mindset to control the fate of the people of our country specifically the people of Pine Bluff we cannot allow that type of well they got more they, they have more so they must know more that's not accurate I've you, you may have, uh, I haven't interviewed everyone, but uh, everybody I have interviewed have been this for go forward, and you seem to be on the other side of that, that point. You may have that lane to yourself, actually. 
Well, I refuse to, and I'm, I just, you know, I have to, I have to speak my truth. I can't dump on anyone that I have seen fight for this city and try to do something positive to even think that nothing has come good out of what the, the Go For It Pondla organization has done is absurd. I'm sorry. There's no way that you can say they did nothing right. That's a little extreme. That's just like saying George Bush the second he didn't do a thing right. Or the other side saying, Bill Clinton got it all wrong. Come on, guys. They didn't get it all wrong. And, I, you know, I just, they're Pine Bluff citizens. All of us are. If you're doing positive, if you're doing something to help us go up and to get back to a standard that we actually are or to realize who we are, I support that movement. That's, that's anybody. UAPB, CARC, TOPS program, uh, you know, Palm Bluff School District, Watson Chapel School District. It's so many. Uh, the Cooperative Extension Service, the Forestry Service. We're a tree city. For This is our 10th year being a tree city. Boys and Girls Club of America right over at the community center. We go on and on. So, you know, someone contacted me talking about how negative <clears throat> Pine Bluff is and it'll never go anywhere. They just have amnesia. I said, for every story of tragedy that you give me, I can give you three of success. And I'm not talking about Tory Hunter made it out. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying if you tell me that the young man whose mother I went to school with and whose brothers I know who lost his life on Georgia Street, who impacted that team greatly and hurt this community by his death, if you tell me about that, I'll pray for him and his family. And I, I'm affected by that because I had him pegged as one of the next great stars in Pine Bluff in sports. His name was uh, Burnett, number 25 for the Zebras. Watch this, but, I, but am I gonna only focus on that or am I gonna look at the fact that Courtney Crutchfield just went to the All-American Bowl? Austin Dendy just got a, a, a scholarship to Missouri. Jordan Harris is at Missouri. Many other kids have gotten scholarships to go to college and further their lives. That's three right there. I can keep going. You have youth who are at the Arts and Science Center who are putting their talent on display, who one day, Ebony Edwards, a mentee of mine, she went to the University of Southern Arkansas uh, to basically be an actor, and then she went to the University of Indiana, and now she's in New York doing great things. She's on. She's doing theater. She's into movies. But guess what? She got a start. Arts and Science Center. We have to promote the positive. Not selling a dream. It's here. But if all you're going to look at is how bad it is, you'll never see bluer skies. So if um, the, the Go Forward tax goes away in September, of this year, does Pine Bluff need a sales tax? And if so, what would you do with it? Pine Bluff? Need another sales tax. We, we already have some. Well, I believe the people need to breathe for a moment. But history shows that you, know, you had the penny for progress. That was way more than the 5 H tax. What I would do is look at history. What did that penny for progress do? in the city, I want to see everything that that, that that did. What is the soda pop tax doing? What is the hamburger tax doing? What is it actually putting money to, right? And then what did the 5 cent go for it, 2017 sales tax, what did that do? 
I think the people need a breather and a break, and we need to reevaluate what's needed in the city. The way I would, let's say, hypothetically, if a tax came back, go for, we ain't worried about the name. If a tax comes back to the city, again, let's Pine Bluff first tax. I would be focusing on infrastructure, uh, Really, I'll be focusing on safety, development, and collaborations because it's going to equal prosperity for Pine Bluff. And within those pillars, you can find whatever you need to find. Public Works Department, drainage, communications, and marketing department. How are we going to be a destination city? And we don't even market ourselves. Let me give you a perfect example. I saw a commercial on YouTube about Chicago. It was a beautiful commercial. It was highlighting their food culture. Uh, the Chicago River, when they turn it green, and all of it for St. Patty's Day. All of these wonderful, the taste of Chicago. Well, you and I know, you're a journalist, you and I know that Chicago is one of the most dangerous cities in the world in real life. I'm not, that doesn't diminish that we have some things happening in Pine Bluff, but we're talking 500 murders. But yet, they have videos that I talk about how great Chicago is. We have to take some cues from what is being successful around the country. And we, what we do is we promote the positive and we work on the negative. We don't go and say, look at how dirty we are. And this is a trashy town. And this is the ghetto. You have people talking about, this is ghetto. This is the ghetto. And look at this nasty town. Really? This is where you live? What do you what are you saying? No, let's talk about how great this town is because it is. The people are. And then I see this dirt behind the cabinet. We're going to clean that up too, but I'm not going to invite you to my home and then say, look at this dirt down here in the cellar. It makes no sense if I'm trying to promote where I live. So one of the, you mentioned uh, being a destination city. I know one of the things that uh, is going on is Jimmy Cunningham's mm -hmm. uh, Delta Rhythm and Bios, um, cultural district, historical, uh, to increase um, historic, historical tourism. Um, are, are you on board with that? Similar to the other thing you asked about the EFPB, I am on board with tenants of that but not all of it. It is important for us to accentuate the culture and the history of our city and of that particular delta, you know, rhythm, bayous, et cetera, the music scene. It's important that we do that. But I think that we're a little bit we have to we have to be careful with that because again we look around we don't just blindly do things we look around to see what's successful so i ask myself when i look at that particular plan in its entirety what's happening in memphis you know what's happening in clarksdale mississippi what's happening in in, in atlanta at you know at these different museums and in selma Right? What's happening at the African American Museum in Washington, D.C.? Are they getting the same tourism numbers that we are expecting with this situation? And then I have to look at that carefully. Then I have to look at how we're going to pay for it. And then people say, well, we'll just use a tax to pay for it. But is that the best thing to do? But I see some elements within that plan that are good. But once again, there's at least 10 plans that I could grab a hold to and pull some really good stuff out of that we currently have in the city of Pine Bluff right now. The Economic Community Development has a plan for the University Park area, and it looks great. It needs some updating. We need to get behind UAPB and help them in that area because can Pine Bluff be? One thing that I want to do as mayor is Pine Bluff has to be identified as a college town. You don't hear people talk about Pine Bluff's a college town. You hear Russellville, Conway, Jonesboro, Searcy, that's a college town. But when it comes to Pine Bluff, 
You're right. They tried to create a narrative for us. We're not Crime Bluff. We're a college town with a four-year and a two-year institution of learning. That's what we. That's what we are. Then we we promote that. UAPB is doing a wonderful job all across the country, but especially in Arkansas. I saw a billboard the other day in Fordyce of UAPB. We have to get behind that effort because UAPB's flag has to fly over Pine Bluff, and the Pine Bluff flag has to fly at UAPB. We cannot be two silos, not to be one successful. Of, one of the things that gets talked about a lot is, you know, and I would totally agree with you about the, the college town, your reference to that, but developing that area around the college to make it more um, accessible by college students. Yes. You know, what, what college do you know that doesn't have, you know, their homes, you know, you know little restaurants and cafes and coffee shops and whatnot that, that populate around a college that because they're going to be right there. They're walking distance. Um, maybe they don't have cars because you wouldn't need a car in most places. You go to Columbia, Missouri, and you know it's of course it's a it's night and day. It's like Fayetteville or something, you yeah. know. But still, you scale it to where there are some developments in that area. It just doesn't seem to ever take hold. My experience in track and field uh, afforded me the opportunity to go to places that many people don't think about like Gainesville, Florida, where the University of Florida is. That's, a, that's probably one of my favorite towns. These places like Starkville, Mississippi. Right. What you're saying is right, Byron. That's why development equals prosperity for Palm Bluff. We have to develop in areas like that on the north side, specifically in the University Park area and on down in the University Mall area that it's conducive to the students over there. There's nowhere to eat. They have to come into the city and interact. And I taught out there. A lot of interact. most of them don't have cars. Or right. Students you have to, I taught. You go to some of these places that there is when within walking distance where they can get good food. They can have they can hang out stress-free we have to mobilize and to create an environment over on that part of town that's conducive to learning and that will make them want to stay when people come into Palm Bluff and they come that's why Martha Mitchell was so important when um, I took under that project uh, under the mayor's direction Parks and Recreation took under the project to clean Martha Mitchell. Right. And all the new landscaping, we planted that, that uh, those things. We did that. We took um, our resources on behalf of the city because people say, well, that's not Parks and Recreation. Well, it's under the auspicious of the mayor, and, it, and she says, do this, and we're, we're going to do this right here. It's going toward the city. So why did we clean that corridor? So that when they get off on exit 35, they come down and see a beautiful city and they make a left turn and they see the, the marquee of UAPB. Yeah. But then they see a cemetery, yeah. this gas station, this rundown, burnout. Then we got to do something about this. Because when you turn down the Dave Ward exit in Conway and you roll into UCA, you don't see that. You see beautiful. And we can do that as well, but it has to be intentional. You can't have that dim orange lighting when you go down University Drive on the way to the, where am I, in Jeepers Creepers or something? Like, it's, it's really awkward. We can do something, the city can do something about this. And I, I, if, I, when I am, uh, if I'm elected mayor, I'm definitely gonna do something about the development of every anchor in the city because this, this is what I want to do as it pertains to development. See, when we invest in each anchor, like UAPB, Central Park, J.C. Jeffries, uh, the Aquatic Center, even the Community Center on Ash Street, 
and within four to four blocks of each one of those things, four to six blocks, we clean that area up. Pine Bluff High School, they're talking about doing a new school there. It needs to stay at 11th Street. And then what we need to do as the city is clean up that area around it really nice. Around Sea Arc, let's clean up. Circle Drive, all of that, really good. And then those anchors will begin to be centers of success with nice homes, affordable homes, clean streets, clean sidewalks, new sidewalks. You got places in Palm Love that haven't seen a sidewalk since the 80s. You know why? Because it's just grown over. It's under there. <laughs> we take those anchors and we connect them. And once you do that, now you're starting to see the prosperous community again that we want to see. It's just disjointed. We have to put our resources in the right bit, real focus, and put those resources in the proper place and then activate and see my time as the Parks and Recreation Director afforded me the opportunity to work with Craft and Toll. We drove around the city and I showed, I gave them the history of the city and showed them the different avenues. That's where they came up with the community anchors. I was in the vehicle with them saying, well, eliminate, strengthen, consolidate. This is, this is, this is what my input is. And through that, we are able to see that Pine Bluff, it's like, it's like a, many people have said it's a gold mine, right? It's under the dirt. There's just some dirt on top of it. We just need to get some of this off, recognize it, communicate better, get community again, and then we can start having these centers of success in our neighborhoods, and then we can have neighborhoods again. I can see a place where we get wayfinding signs in the city. When you go to Fayetteville, they have wayfinding signs. Wilson Park is this way. And you see four of those. We need that in the city. You know, some people kind of knock the um, the entry signs. We needed that so badly. It's beautiful because it's saying, welcome to Pine Bluff. How do you feel about your city? How do you feel about your neighbor? If anything negative comes up, you need to refocus because this is where you live. This is our home. So I'm not selling a dream to the people. I'm talking about hope. And I'm talking about the future. That kind of feeds into my next question. You know, we have, we've got a grocery store that went out. Um, down the street, the furniture store is leaving. Um, that's happened a lot across the years. Some of that is perhaps just the erosion of brick and mortar or, you know, and it's not just a time bluff thing, but um, what, what is, a, as a mayor, what, what can you do? I mean, you can't brick it. You can't replace a grocery store with, you know, ordering on Amazon necessarily. You need fruits and vegetables. and. What, what can you as a mayor, what could you as a mayor do to push back against the, that sort of erosion? Well, it's going to take some innovative thinking. I like what the young councilwoman in the first ward is doing. You know, when, when Super One... Miss Brunson? Miss Brunson, that's her name. Uh, when, yeah, Leticia Brunson you know, in the first ward. Yeah. When that grocery store on East Harden went down, she immediately put her running shoes on and tried to get a grocery store in that ward immediately. And I find, and then I, I can appreciate what Leland Stice did, bringing doctor's orders over there. We need a pharmacy over there. What that, that's being connected in the community and caring and saying, well, we're not just gonna let it die, right? And so what I would do is I would work closely with the city council. It's three entities. Um, well, I'm gonna say four. I'll start from the outside in. The Alliance, first of all, the Alliance, part, you know, working more closely with them and with Allison uh, Thompson over there, it's important. We have to have good lines of communication over there. The A&P, shared story and the things that they're doing, 
and then the city council. They're and they're they're they as well as the mayor are ambassadors to the city. I would challenge every city council member. I would challenge them to go out and recruit new business every quarter and actually work to work on it. Work on trying to bring in new businesses, no matter what that is. Look into innovation, do some research. I would challenge them to do these things and come back and let's sit down and have an executive meeting and say, okay, first war, what'd you work on? What'd you work on? Let's hold each other accountable because you're an ambassador of the city. So why is it that the mayor's office should bring the restaurants in? No, second war, councilman, whoever, or council member, so-and-so, what did you do this second quarter to bring in new business into the city? Who did you contact? What did you, tell me something. We need to work together. This isn't just for you. Mayor didn't bring anything in. No, what did you do? That, you know, we, we have to do that. That's holding each other accountable and saying, wait a minute. And I saying this is, we're limited to eight, but you have eight council members and you have a mayor at the minimum those individuals, as well as the Alliance and a &P, and then the fourth piece, the Communications and Marketing Department that I talked about bringing. See, I wanna create two departments, Public Works and Communication and Marketing, which, is, which will help brand us and put that communication across to our citizens. Those four things will generate new business in Palm Bluff, because then we can then turn around and use some of our resources to make incentives. Like the thing that they did over with Chick-fil-A, that was necessary. Some people say, well, we shouldn't be paying people to come in. Well, what do you want to do? They're proving, the businesses are proving that they don't want to come. So we have to do something like that to get a Chick-fil-A because it's, a, it's, it's more than just a Burger King, it's Chick-fil-A. People say, well, you act like you never had that before. Chick-fil-A is not a store, it's a brand. And if Chick-fil-A can, this is the ideology. If Chick-fil-A can thrive in Pine Bluff, who is poor and, and economically depraved and, 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 and violent and this and that, if it can, if it can thrive here, that's selling the brand of Pine Bluff to say, no, 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 you can come to um, a Jimmy John's because Jimmy John, I'm not knocking Subway, but Jimmy John's is not Subway. It's a different type of brand that begins to say, well, oh, they're successful, so Olive Garden can come and Golden Corral can come. But what I really want to focus on is the leaders of this city going out and in intentionally recruiting new business and bringing it back and let's have an executive session and say what are we doing and then we start getting behind these ideas and not just you know throwing spit on the wall and, and hoping that it sticks so you mentioned sherry's story and i've you know, i've covered their meetings some and their issues you know on her side of the aisle they spent way too much supporting the convention center keeping the lights on and the air conditioners running and so forth. To the extent that she feels like they don't have the money, they, they should be spending that money on actually promoting Pine Bluff. On, then you got Mr. McCorvey who actually runs the place and it's a decades old, old building with infrastructure of an old building. Um, how do those things coexist? He, he can't bring in the, you know, the, the business. Now he says if he gets the hotel, that will help, but he can't have people come to a uh, facility that's not top notch. Um, and yet Sherry is, is, you know, she would rather spend her money someplace else besides, you know, the majority of it, keeping an old uh, convention center going. Some, some cities have outsourced those things. Um, Explain how you would fix all that. Well, another part of another part of my plan is we have to get behind the convention center. That what do you think the convention center is doing? 
when you bring an event like the King Cotton in, they're promoting the city of Pine Bluff. There's no event in this, really in the state of Arkansas that can do the same thing that that one you know, event is doing. Let me tell you why. This year, we had a viewer, we had a, 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 a reach, and I have the numbers, and I'll, I'll share it on my uh, Facebook page, uh, Sam Glover for Mayor on Facebook. But we had a reach of over 38 million people we had a viewership of almost 200, over 250,000 people were watching and tuning in on it. This is marketing at its best. It's, we're being mentioned in Max Preps and we were mentioned in the Washington Post because Gonzaga College Prep won the tournament. And they're talking about Pine Bluff, Arkansas and the King Cotton Classic, which are synonymous in the Washington Post. That matters. They weren't talking about Hot Springs. They weren't talking about the Razorbacks. They weren't talking about, you know, how great, you know, Arkansas State is or any of those people. They're talking about Pine Bluff, Arkansas, where we live, and they're talking about the brand of the King Cotton Holiday Classic that's happening at the Pine Bluff Convention Center. And then you're seeing reviews from, these are top-notch programs, so people say, well, what are you saying? Gonzaga College Prep is sponsored by Nike. Duncanville High School is sponsored by Nike. Archbishop Wood from Philadelphia or Westminster, Pennsylvania is sponsored by Nike. Uh, uh, two of the teams were sponsored from Atlanta were sponsored by the Jordan brand. So they say, well, where'd y'all? They have to, re so tell you a little bit how that works. They have to respond to their sponsor and say, well, we're going to this tournament, that tournament. So now, King Cotton and Pine Bluff is being mentioned in the circles of Nike in Oregon. The Jordan brand is saying this is a top-notch quality event that our teams are going to, right? That's marketing at its best. You can't tear down the convention center or replace it or outsource it to where? We, we understand that you couldn't, you know what? You could not build the convention center that we have over there right now. You could not rebuild that for less than 50, 60, 70 million. Yeah. But you can get intentional and put 10 million into it and renovate it and really have something nice. 5A state champion, uh, state. Should we rename? Should we, should we sell the naming rights to someone? <laughs> I believe Mr. McCorvey is open to that. And we should be open to that as a city. Whatever it takes for us to get forward, we need to do it. They do it in Fayetteville. What's the name of What's the name of the football stadium? Donald W. Reynolds Razorback Stadium at Frank Broyles Field, Bud Walton Arena, Baum Stadium, Randall Tyson Track Center, Willard Walker Pavilion. You need to come on. So we yeah. can't look I'm, at when. What did Simmons spend for Altel Arena? Put their name on. Right, that's the Simmons Arena. It's the 21st century. Any place you go to that's prospering and thriving, they're operating like this. And what we have to do is come out of this archaic mode of doing business, of doing government, and of communicating with our people. We have to elevate. It's time. So my last question, and it may not even be a lane that a mayor can operate in, but you know, our, we're, we're, our school district is, is moving in the right direction, it would appear. But it's got a ways to go. You got um, air, school districts around here that run circles around Pine Bluff in, in a number of ways. Um, is, there, is there something that a mayor of I know this is not, you're not a superintendent, but is there something a mayor can do in Pine Bluff that can help them get back on track? I'm glad you asked that. Yes, it is. We have to stand shoulder to shoulder with our schools and our nonprofit organizations. I'm gonna give you a bird's eye quickly on how, from the mayor's office and from city government, we can assist in a major way. Because 
We use our resources now. I'm circling back to how we use our resources and our programming that is in the budget for parks and recreation. Let's start at parks and recreation. And we create youth programs and summer programs, spring break programs, winter break. We go ahead and extend that. And youth, youth sports. We're doing all of that. Then we take it to the next level in partnering with the generator and the aquatic center to teaching the swimming. We had a grant, $800,000 grant to teach kids how to swim and that program. So we have all of that happen for small children. Keep feeder system in mind because Pine Bluff has everything we need right here. We just need to understand it and go with it. We're undergirding them after school programs, boys and girls and boys and girls club, tops, uh, the Ivy Center, all of those things we're undergirding, undergirding. We're using, we, we can use, we can use, we can't give them money directly, but what we can do is use our resources and our platform to promote these districts, Watson Chapel School District. We promote them. And then as we coming up, then they get involved in the summer youth job program. Now we have jobs for, and we partner with these, with the small business community. Everybody working together. We partner with the business community. We say, listen here, um, Ephesus Bookstore, they're, they're one of the ones, and some of the local, even daycares, and they'll give us two jobs. Well, let's, let's extend that. And let's say, hey, Kevin Barnett, can we have one job over at State Farm? Hey, Archie Sanders, can we have one job for our, for our youth? at your place of business. We extend that, expand that to 100 jobs. Try to forward everywhere in the city, even the small business. We just need one. Like Some public, may be able to do more. Public internships. Public internships, but we're running it through the city job work program. Then we have jobs within the city. Now we're getting the kids revenue. We have our hands on them. We're training them. We're keeping them off the streets. We're doing all of those things, while at the same time, we are with UAPB and CR because this is our resource that we have and we're inviting them in through collaborations to equal prosperity in Palm Bluff. And we're saying, listen, let us use your food science program and, 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 and this new uh, management uh, degree that they have that they're doing out there with the casino management with the, through Saracen and then the culinary uh, with CR and and how they're working with the convention center in their new kitchen. See how that's all working together? And we're undergirding them and we have the kids, we have our hands on them. And then we're saying, look at this, look at this young man or woman that we have developed from the youth programs all the way up through all of this we're doing. And here you go, UAPB. Here you go, truck driving school. Here you go, CR. And if they don't want to do that, then we say, we wish you well, go make Pound Buff proud. And when you get on social media, you make sure you tell them, I'm from Pine Bluff and I go to the University of Indiana. Hey, I'm from Pine Bluff and I work for NRCS in Bakersfield, California. Hi, I'm from Pine Bluff. Mm -hmm. And I, I, play, I play for the University of Missouri and I led the nation in receiving. Hey, my name is Austin Dendy. I'm from Pine Bluff and I'm the defensive rookie of the year. And Crutchfield going there too. Crutchfield. And uh, uh, Crutchfield, you know, he's going to play. Uh, we don't know what he's going to play, but hey, I led, I, led, I led the Missouri Tigers in, re in receiving. Hey, you know, we could go on and on. Hey, my name is Caleb Higgins. I go to Sacramento State. It's not all just, you know, hey, I'm so and so. And, 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 and I am. In, in my second year in med school, and I'm from Pine Bluff, but where did they get that from? It's because from here, at the youth programs, when we were socializing and culturing uh, them, we were teaching them how to do that, which is one of the reasons why uh, we at Parks and Recreation, at the community center, when I designed that and sat down with Nelson Architects and said, I want a teaching kitchen, I want a state-of-the-art studio in here that was me thinking forward and saying we can teach the kids how to do podcasts online advertising teaching them how to monetize what they do we have the space and the vision to do whatever we want to do and we can get back to 
the days of reading Rainbow and saying, I can be anything that I want to be. If we are not instilling hope and lighting the flame under these children and back into the hearts of the people of Pine Bluff, it will tank. I don't want to hear about how we're losing people and not. We can do it by few or by many. We've lost 10,000 people and Pine Bluff is still great. We can get 20,000 people to move in and Pine Bluff will still be great again. It was great in the 80s, great in the 90s, 2024 is still great because I just told you that kids are getting scholarships. I just saw Indonesia Jackson, who was the valid Victorian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's at your, she's doing just great. I can just start more and more. I can name athletes. I can name singers, doctors, lawyers. They're doing well. They're from here. They're doing it here. And what we have to do is support them and yeah. promote us. One of our... Um, I I hear this um, fairly regularly. We we run a feature that comes up through A and P, um, the Explore Pine Bluff feature on Mondays, and I'm always excited about what's what what they're going to talk about because it's you know some piece of history, some and some influential person. Chances are that has because of them we have X, Y, and Z or uh, cuts in part. If let us, do we have, this is where we usually turn the uh, program over to the people who are still with us and have asked questions, do we have? Um, most of them he answered, but I can kind of go through. Um, you get the award for the longest. <laughs> ah. <laughs> what are you going to do about city facilities that are not economically beneficial for single parents with multiple children. What can you do to help single income families below the poverty line? Um, I so, ask one more time. Okay. Public facilities. What are you going to do about city facilities that are not economically beneficial for single parents okay. with multiple children? What can you do to help single income families below the poverty line? Okay. Well, our, our public facilities, let me just say this. I do empathize with those who you know, are economically constrained. Uh, and that's one of the reasons. And they say, all he talks about is King Cotton, but I'm just using it as a reference. We try to make every event and every activity that we do in the city affordable. And there's nowhere in the, nowhere in the country where you can have an, go to an event like that for 15 bucks. People see that and they actually fuss us out and say, what are you guys doing? This is a $45 ticket. And we're like, we can't do that in our area. We're, we don't, we're not trying to make money. We're trying to create activity. And so then when it costs, you know, $30 a year to go to the Boys and Girls Club, we feel like that's affordable, but, but then we, we do a drive. We had a, we had a, a almost a tele, a, a, a impromptu telethon on Delta Plex and people were calling in. I remember uh, Sheriff Lafayette Woods and, and Will Jenkins and you know, I'm just, I'm dropping a few names of people who called in and said, I can give 35, I'll sponsor a kid, I'll sponsor a kid, I'll sponsor four, I'll sponsor five. That's how we do it. We do it by helping each other, but it's two sides of that coin. I need for some of the families who are economically constrained to come and receive the services that we are trying to give them as well to help them to get out of that state or to educate them to assist and not just be, well, just everything for free because at the same time, you do have to upkeep those facilities. There has to be some type of fee associated to some of the things. Um, and so I believe that $5 to swim at a state-of-the-art aquatic center is affordable in a second class, first class and second class city. It is. 
five dollars is affordable. And then, but but then we have an eight hundred thousand dollar grant to teach you free swimming. So come to the program, right? And and I believe just more of that. That's but that's also one of the reasons why I don't feel like we need a police pay count. That's not necessary. No, let's take those resources that they were using for that and put them in parks and recreation where it belongs so that we can have youth programming and we can provide a free service. But we're going to provide this for free. We're going to provide the golf camps and the tennis camps and the baseball camps. We're going to provide all that for free. Now we need to you to invest in yourself. $30 a year for the Boys and Girls Club. 30 divided by you know, 300 something days, can you bring a quarter a day? Can you have a look? It's, it's about trying to have a little skin in the game. I know you don't have any money, but can you bring a quarter every day? And we'll, we'll even make it a project. Every kid that's a part of Boys and Girls Club, we'll put a, 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 a jar up in a, in, a, in a storage room, put their name on it, you bring your quarter every day, and we'll just keep putting it in there just so that kid and that family can be accountable and have some skin in the game and say, I'm invested in my kid's future, even if it's a quarter. It's not what you give, it's how you're giving it. Do you believe in your child enough to come up with a quarter a day? The process of giving. Yeah. It's about working together. And finally, single family home. I thought, you know, the Alice program that they came up with, and it's not, it's not something new, but it was new to this area. The purpose of that was to get those single family home. That's what Alice was doing. Um, it's for income constrained yet working families. So you're working a full time job, you've got those children, and but you're renting, you're paying a seven, eight hundred dollar rent. One of the reasons, as we back to the beginning of our story, you talked about how you know you're renting a home, you bought the home, you all these different things. The home ownership went down in Palm Bluff. That was part of the decline. And you had people who have never owned homes before, and then they're getting in those homes, and they're just basically tearing them up. Well, what the Alice program did was started giving people an opportunity or an avenue to have home ownership. We know that the first, the cornerstone, one of the cornerstones of prosperity in, in the United States is home ownership. So when you do that, and then you get them enrolled in this Pine Bluff um, Homeowners Association for the citywide and you giving them resources and training on how to run a home and giving them pride again. Now they own something. They own a piece of America, so to speak. We help them by training them to be prosperous and not remaining in a condition of poverty. Poverty is a mindset that has to be broken and it has had people of color bound for a long time. We have to break generational, um, traditional, generational, what seems to be curses off of the thinking. And that's the cultural aspect. So when I talk about blazing a path for a brighter future in Pine Bluff, I'm talking about physically, through infrastructure, and schools and things of that nature to socially being able to sit down at the King Cotton without people fighting, be able to go to a, a Christmas thing with, you know, where it's ice skating and people are, you never ice skated before and we'll get out here and fall together where it's a uh, food of Palooza down on Saracen landing and occasion, you know, um, seafood bowl and we having spade night and all of this on the landing. Right. And, Spiritually, our church is coming together and helping to mentor, kind of like the ministerial alliance that's already in place, just more act, more unity. And then culturally, coming out of the mindsets of it can only be this way, and if it's not, I'm not involved. No, we need you to be involved, but if, it's, if your idea doesn't come to the table, stop taking your ball and going home. Because we need you somewhere. We need that energy to be directed in a certain area, but it might not be at the top. Everybody can't be the mayor. Right. And everybody can't be a council member. But what we can do 
is together we can be people centric and help one another. You got about two more. Um, so you kind of addressed this when we talked about the parks and rec. Um, this comment says, we have enough city leaders with alleged improprieties le le levied against them as well as you do. So why should we consider more of the same and elect you as mayor? Well, Ms. Thomas, Again, I can only speak from truth and a matter of record. Matter of record is simple. There is no misappropriation of funds from Sam Glover. And as a matter of fact, during a FOIA, I looked and 50% of the points from the legislative audit came after I resigned. So how'd that happen? So at that thing, it says Parks and Recreation. It doesn't say Sam Glover did this, but we know that I was a park director before February the 9th. Do your own for you. That report says that I did not take it before the city council to sign a contract. It didn't say I messed any money up. They're still using the golf carts at Harbor Oaks now. When I leave here, if I want to go play a round of golf, I can go to Harbor Oaks and be on the same carts that I leased on behalf of the city for Parks and Rec for golf. So I, I don't have any, I have allegations, but those allegations are false. It's a false narrative. And I, what I believe is people need more information so they can actually understand what is going on. And we can't just allow people to go and well, I'm going to file a police report just because I feel like it. Well, if I go down here today and say, Byron Tate stole my car, and I'm going to file a police report, that's a felony. Because he didn't do any of that. Um, how many of the sponsors that you mentioned, um, like Nike, have contacted you and have offered to sponsor the King Cotton Classic or to acquire a name and rights to the arena floor or the entire convention center complex? Good, great question. Uh, a matter of uh, understanding again. So there is a process. Just because King Cotton is great and it looks good, it takes a lot of effort to get them to get behind this because again this is a business and what we're saying is nike will you come to pine bluff arkansas is there any benefit of you being here and they have to say yes it is and then they have to say well why it doesn't matter that the walton foundation is worth 300 billion dollars so they don't have to come here so when they choose to, it means that we have done something to make them say, this is a good place to invest. That being said, we've not gotten that call yet because they don't operate like you think. You can't just, there's no one that I could contact at Nike and say, hey, will you do this? That's not how they operate. They, you get an email and a call through this person who you know because they talk to those four teams and then they talk to Centennial that came two years ago and say, what do you know about this King Cotton business? What about Sam Glover? Is he a good person to deal with? Then I get a contact and they say, we've been looking at you guys. We've seen the forward momentum and the upward growth in Pine Bluff and we want to do this, this, and this. So if you have to, if you have to call them, then then you shouldn't. No. The call if you call, the if room. you call them, you may have thrown yourself back five years. <laughs> okay. So it's best to just keep doing what you're doing because let me tell you something. We love Nike and we love Under Armour and any of these national brands that you're talking about, but we also love Simmons Bank. They've been there for us and they backed this community and they backed the King Cotton Holiday Classic. Central Maloney stepped out and they were the title sponsor this year and Simmons was the presenting sponsor. We weren't pulling resources out of the, uh, out of the tax dollars like that. The, we have sponsors. 
Yes, they're coming out of their own pocket. JRMC, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. I don't want to get to name it too many because I don't want to miss anybody, but just know that doctor's orders and people are are putting 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, 75,000, 25,000 so that you can have a King Cotton Holiday Classic for the culture and the brand of Fine Bluff. That is so vital to know that they would do that. Uh, and so it is my belief that the city of Pine Bluff actually as a city should invest in that particular tournament moving forward and city of Pine Bluff should be the title sponsor of the King Cotton every year because it's our brand. There's not any other thing connected to Pine Bluff that is more polarizing and has more reach than that. That is our branding opportunity. What are we going to do with it? Okay, last question. Um, you mentioned the Alice program, um, but this comment says the city of Palm Bluff has a down payment and closing cost assistance program. What would you do to market this program so people will know that it helps when buying a home? Well, that's why we need a communications and marketing department. You know, we, we fielded a, uh, a question the other day in the forum talking about uh, the contracts. And many people are concerned about if it's fair. And, you know, we as leaders have a responsibility to give the community accurate information. Accurate and consistent. And we need to create a marketing and communication department to facilitate the communication of the latest news and events through multiple avenues and create a national brand awareness for the city. So the bottom line is this department will be totally responsible to get that information in the hands of the citizens. And then not just, hey, we told you, check the box off. No, we told you, we followed up, we're helping you through the process so you can understand how to do this. You don't just say, that's part of the, the issue is like, we feel like we're not responsible for helping our city. You know how hard it is to do business with the city? That's one thing I wanna change almost immediately is the ease of doing business with the city. We shouldn't have to go through the trials of Job to get a permit to build? Yeah, I've heard that. It's absurd. But we're going to, we're going to change. Some of it's archaic. Again, you can't, you can't put in an application through the city website on an actual fillable form. That's not going to work. And, and other other things. So that communication and marketing department would do that. And what the public works department would do is deal with this drainage and the cleanliness of the city and, and how we look. See, we deal with how we look, how we think, how we feel. We undergird what's already here, strengthen it. Then we tell everybody about it. And then we tell ourselves that we're, we're, we're we're good. We're okay. Speak well of yourself. Even, you know, whether you're a spiritual person or, or not or whatever, they even the basic thing tell you to, to speak well of yourself and you'll have long health and long life. Yeah. Um, I think we're out of Okay, so this is your opportunity. This is basically your closing remarks, if you'd like. Well, What I want the voters to know is simple. We are on a mission to create stability and hope for the development of our community and for generations to come. And when I start talking like this, this isn't about a pageant or some type of, I don't sit around thinking about great catchphrases. I've lived this, I am this. And when I pour out into our youth, into our community, when I pour out into a job like Parks and Recreation, like my wife said, you're giving everything to it because I believe in it. I know that they need this 
for the quality of our life. Our children are gonna need it later. So when I say we are on a mission, that's what we're on. And I need your support. And I need the support of all those that still believe in Pine Bluff and that there's still hope. If you don't believe, you know, that's okay. But there are still those who are standing and fighting the good fight. And on February 19th through March 5th, what I want people to know is this final thing. Your vote is your own. When you get in that booth, you may have loyalties to some people. You may have made alliances and allegiances. But I believe you know in your heart where this city needs to go. And I am hopeful that you have heard what you needed to hear and your heart is telling you what needs to happen in this city and your vote is your own. And when you vote for Glover, you're voting for the future and the future is now. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you.